as one of the hottest teams in the country. And on Saturday, they were getting some hot pitching from their starter, Jeff Bronke. He was setting down the Hurricanes of Miami. Also got some great help defensively and kept the shutout going, waiting for some help from his offense. It came in the fourth inning. The bat of Scott Wilkinson starting things off. Wilkinson came up with a base hit that put the Cowboys ahead 1-0, and then Miami helped out with an error that allowed the second run to score, and Oklahoma State was out in front to zip. But the defending champions from Miami did not quit. They came back to tie the game in the seventh inning. Then they went ahead in the ninth inning. And when they got the lead, it was time for Rick Rather. The All-American coach Gary Ward feared most shut down the Cowboys in the ninth inning and sent them into the loser's bracket. Jim Ward's Indiana State team also fell victim to a hot pitcher in the person of Mike Loyne. It was Loyne tying the NCAA Division I record with his 20th win of the year and 10 strikeouts. A good effort for Indiana State. They must fight today to stay alive. There will be no tomorrow in Omaha for either Oklahoma State or Indiana State because Game 6 is an elimination game in the 1986 NCAA College World Series. That means for Coach Gary Ward, that elusive collegiate championship he's been after for the last six years will have to be gained the hard way through the loser's bracket. Let's meet his starting lineup for tonight. Leading off and playing second base is Sergio Espinal, a junior from New York. Batting second is the shortstop, Monty Ferris, a freshman from Leedy, Oklahoma. Batting third and playing third is Robin Ventura, a freshman from Santa Maria, California. Batting fourth is the designated hitter, Jim Ifland, a junior from Santa Cruz, California. Batting fifth and playing first base, Jimmy Berrigan, a junior from San Diego, California. Batting sixth tonight is the catcher, Adam Smith, a sophomore from San Jose, California. Batting seventh and playing center field is Scott Wilkinson, a junior from Anaheim, California. Batting eighth, the right fielder, Brian Cusco, a freshman from Poland, Ohio. And batting ninth is the left fielder, Anthony Blackman, a junior from Gary, Indiana. Defensively, for Indiana State, it is Boy Rodriguez at third, Dan Roman the shortstop, Mike Lexa at second base, and Jeff Buell at first base. The outfield from left to right, T.J. Burke, Bob Zion, and Paul Fry. And the battery for tonight, Mike Everly behind the plate, and Mike Gardiner on the mound. And let's talk about this 20-year-old junior. He's from uh, Ontario, Canada. Sarnia is his hometown in Ontario, Canada. He is 6'1", 190. Comes in with a record of 8 and 2. Strikeout to walk ratio is, is very good. They're 8 and 2 with one save. He is starting tonight for the 12th time this season. His 18th appearance overall. And he has 26 strikeouts, or rather 26 walks and 80 strikeouts in 80 innings. And Mike Gardiner, he's a strange pitcher in that he uses his changeup to set up the fastball. But as I mentioned, that's the reason he's starting tonight because Oklahoma State is a notorious fastball hitting team that drives the fastball out of the ballpark. And they wanted a guy that could keep him in the ballpark and give them a chance to win this ballgame. Because as you know, Oklahoma State scores a lot of runs, they have a lot of power, and they have to be offset by the off-speed pitches. And they hit a ton of home runs, but there may be some additional help for the Sycamores tonight, and we're talking about the wind and the weather because the flag is blowing in. It is 79 degrees clear. The wind from the northeast at 5 to 10, but I have to think right now at the ballpark, it's a little stronger than that. Very little chance of rain, and you can see it is coming directly in, basically from center field. At times, it shifts over and blows straight in from left, but it will help the pitchers if there is going to be some help in that area tonight. Well, I think it'll help Gardner, too, because with a guy throwing a changeup, you have a tendency to hit a lot of balls in the air, and that will help him to keep the ball in the ballpark. So we are set for game six. LSU eliminating Maine eight to four in the first game this afternoon. LSU awaiting the loser of the Miami-Florida State game, which comes on Tuesday. Monday's game, a solo game tomorrow night on ESPN. It is Loyola Marymount against Arizona. That'll be eight o'clock Eastern time tomorrow night. Right here from Omaha, Nebraska. Leading off Sergio Espinal, 343 average, nine homers and 50 RBIs. He's from New York, off the streets of New York to the plains of Oklahoma to play baseball in Stillwater. Two for four in their loss to Miami. Six to two was the score in that game on Saturday as the Hurricanes defending champions came up with four runs in the top of the ninth inning. And they let Rick Rather take care of the rest. 
that pitch right there is one of the reasons that they feel that Mike Gardner can be successful tonight. He will pitch inside. And when you're throwing a lot of off-speed pitches or the breaking ball, you have to throw the fastball inside to keep the other team honest. That's a little off-speed breaking ball, and it's two and one. Two balls, one strike. And that's a natural pattern there where you throw the fastball inside and then come back with the breaking ball. The Cowboys of Oklahoma State closing in on a team record with 124 home runs this year. A lot of those in the friendly confines of Valley Reynolds Stadium in Stillwater where they were 34 and 2 this season on their own turf. But the one thing you can't do is pitch from behind against this Oklahoma State team. So Mike Garten is going to have to settle down and make sure he gets ahead of these hitters. Three balls and one strike. And it's popped in the air. Boy Rodriguez moving in for the first out. A veteran umpiring crew tonight, with the exception of Bob Nelson from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, his first NCAA College World Series. Randy Crystal is the crew chief. He's been here five times from Buda, Texas. At second base, six times. Hank Roundtree of Atlanta has been here in Omaha, Nebraska. And at third in his second NCAA College World Series is Dan Peterson. And we had some discussion last night about balk calls, and we had some talks with some officials today, and the move that is being used, or was being used last night, is fairly common in college baseball. It wasn't unusual at all. Our reaction to it was certainly in no way negative on those umpires who work so very hard out here. That's the way they call the balk, and that's the, the decision that was made, and that's fine. It's got a compact motion here. He stretches out a little farther than I like to see a pitcher, and that causes him to lose his balance a little more. And if that right leg follows over like that, then he pretty much takes himself out of the play at times, right? And that leaves a complete middle of the infield open. Monty Ferris still looking for his first hit in the NCAA College World Series. Against 20-year-old Mike Gardner, Joe mentioned he beat the Japanese team in the Olympics, but he wasn't pitching for the USA. He was pitching for the Canadian Olympic team. 17 and 10 in his collegiate career at Indiana State. In Terre Haute from the Missouri Valley Conference. <laughs> mentioned these two coaches that met each other in the Junior College World Series. Gary Ward was at uh, Yavapai Junior College in Arizona. And right across the way at Iowa Western Community College is where we found Bob Warren. Down on strikes. First strike out of the game for Mike Gartner. Dave Holliday, one of the Holliday brothers, the assistant coach at first base tonight, and Gary Ward himself out at third. Gary Ward, one of the great teachers in college baseball. He's got a lot of theories on hitting and outfield play. He's a very interesting character. Here is the outstanding freshman, Robin Ventura. He's two for four in the game on Saturday. Both singles. Only one RBI in that game for Oklahoma State, which is extremely unusual. Here's a team averaging over 11 runs a game, and they were held to two. So some good pitching by Miami. And that's what Indiana State needs tonight, because they are not a team that can actually battle with these guys on the base pass. Count is one ball and one strike with two outs, nobody on. There is Bob Warren, who was over in Des Moines. Actually started the baseball program there at the junior college. He had been at the school one year before they decided to start baseball. And when they did, they made him the coach. But he has now been at Indiana State for 11 years, and averaging about 40 wins a season. Filed out a play down the left field line. Bob also reminded me of a time in my life that I tried to forget of Fort Polk, Louisiana, when I was there for my uh, Army Reserve training. Bob Warren was one of the people there along with me and he reminded me of that the other day I told him I tried to forget that <laughs> I was in the swamps of Louisiana <laughs> <laughs> those numbers might be a little bigger tonight with that wind blowing in but it can change and the wind has really not been a factor at all in the first couple of games two strikeouts for Mike Gardner here in the top half of inning number one so no scores we go to the bottom half of the first and we're going to meet the Sycamores from Indiana State and Terre Haute and we've already talked a little bit about their head coach. Bob Warren is doing an outstanding job at Indiana State. Let's meet his starting lineup for tonight's game. Leading off is the center fielder, Bobby Zion, a sophomore from Bristol, Wisconsin. Batting second is the shortstop, Danny Roman. He's a junior from Terre Haute. 
In right field, it's Paul Fry, a sophomore from Logansport, Indiana, batting cleanup the third baseman, Boy Rodriguez. He is a sophomore from Bayamon in Puerto Rico. Designated hitter tonight and batting fifth is Dave Travis, a freshman from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Batting sixth and playing second base is Mike Lexa, a senior from Janesville, Wisconsin. Batting seventh is the catcher, Mike Everly. He's a good one, a junior from Rapid City, South Dakota. Batting eighth and playing first base, Jeff Buell, a sophomore from Staunton, Indiana. And batting ninth and playing left field tonight is Terry T.J. Burke. He's a junior from Plainfield, Indiana. Defensively for the Cowboys, it is Ventura at third, Ferris the shortstop, Espinal at second, Berrigan at first, the outfield from left to right, Blackman, Wilkinson, and Costco, and the battery tonight for the Cowboys, it is Rob Walton on the mound and Adam Smith doing the catching. More on Walton as he gets set. Rob Walton is senior now, six feet even. He's from Rutherford, New Jersey, 12 and two with one save. In 113 innings, he has walked 38, struck out 65. He is not a strikeout pitcher. The teams tend to put the ball in play a lot against him. Well, he's a guy that, as Gary Ward describes, there are going to have to be a few line drives hit at people. We're going to have to make a few great plays behind him to get him over the hump the first few innings, and then maybe he'll settle down. But as you mentioned, he's not a strikeout pitcher, so there will be a lot of action. One of the assistants handles the coaching duties at first for Indiana State. Todd Held, number 28, is there. And like the Cowboys, the Sycamores head coach works the third base box. There's Bob Warren. So we're set for baseball here in the bottom half of inning number one. It was a one, two, three, top of the first. A couple of strikeouts for Mike Gardiner. And the top of the order stops with, starts with Bob Zion. Four homers, 296 average. Still looking for his first hit in the NCAA College World Series. And set up what is to follow. Tomorrow night's winner's bracket game with Sam Rosen and Rick Wolf and Irv Brown will have Loyola Marymount against Arizona, 8 o'clock Eastern time. And Joe and I will go back to work on Tuesday with Miami and Florida State. I guess it's the state championship on the line because those teams are 3-3 three and three this year. So Miami, Florida State, that's Tuesday, 8 o'clock Eastern time, also live here on ESPN. One ball and one strike on Bob Zion. Fights it off and chops it in the hole to short. It'll be a long throw for Ferris, and he won't try it. Infield hit for Bob Zion. They're playing Bob the pull, and he just kind of slaps this ball. Actually, he's a lot late on it and grounds it to the left side, and there's no play because the ball's too deep. And Ventura was playing in and was not able to move to his left and cut it off. LSU's next action is set for Wednesday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time, live here on ESPN. We'll have a doubleheader on Wednesday, and LSU will be part of the second half of that doubleheader against the loser of Miami and Florida State. The winner of this game will play the early game on Wednesday against the loser of Loyola Marymount and Arizona. So you're up to date on the bracketing of the 1986 NCAA College World Series. And we have, Joe, we've had some great games to start it off. Excellent ball games. Bob Warren's theory on playing baseball is to try to score one run an inning. By that, he means he doesn't play for the big inning, which is indicated by the fact that the first hitter gets on and he tries to bunt with the next hitter. He tries to score one run per inning, and obviously, if you can do that, you're going to win a lot of ball games. Walton out of the stretch goes to first. Oklahoma State, by contrast, plays for the big inning. Well, when you've had a team total of 124 home runs, you can do that. That's 40 more home runs than Indiana State hit. Ball is outside. Sycamores do not play at home very much. They were 15 and 4. So they played a total of 49 games this year away from their home ballpark, including four regular, regular season games here in uh, Rosenblatt Stadium against Creighton. Well, as they say, that'll get them tournament tough anyway. <laughs> Did not show bunt rattles the mask of Adam Smith. And it's one and two. So at this point, Joe, I, you can almost assume that he's not going to bunt. No, I don't think he will now. Actually, he's a good swing. He's just a hair late on that is the reason that he fouled it off the catcher's mask. Sometimes you wonder why you would want to be a catcher, right? <laughs> I've wondered that from the first time I saw one. Why would you want to be a catcher? One ball, two strikes. Runner at first. Nobody out. We're in the bottom of the first inning. It's all or nothing tonight for these two teams. But you talk about the pressure of being down here 
seven times in the history of the NCAA College World Series, a team has lost its first game, come back to win the championship. Only eight times have teams gone through undefeated. So even though you hear so much about how good it is to be in the winner's bracket, there isn't that much difference. No, you still have to play. You have to win all the games. No matter which bracket you start from, you have to win the same number of ball games. Some of that statistical research done by Jim Wright of the NCAA office, who's here, and we certainly appreciate all of their help, the baseball committee. And Jerry Miles, of course, from the NCAA, overseeing this tournament. One and two, the count. Out evens at two balls and two strikes. Rob Walton is having to work a little bit harder than he would like in the first inning. You don't want to start this men on base business early. No, and his coach Gary Ward says he's basically his limit is about 110 pitches. So if he uses those up in the first couple of innings, Oklahoma State could be in trouble. And keep the names Gordy Dillard, Steve Linhart, and Marv Rockman in your mind. Ground ball up the middle, base hit. Back to back singles to open the game tonight for the Sycamores of Indiana State. Both balls, Joe, were hit on the ground, but they went through. They were hit in the right spot. Right, but I think that shows one of the things there. I think the Oklahoma right State leadoff hitter would have been able to go to third on a ground ball up the middle. I think there again lies one of the differences between these two teams. And it's why it's more imperative for Indiana State to get a well-pitched ball game than it is for o Oklahoma State. Now here's a 397 batter, your number three hitter. You have runners at first and second. We'll see how Coach Warren plays it. He lets him swing away. I would let Paul Fry swing away, too. He is a good hitter. From what I've seen, I agree. He was one for four on Saturday with an RBI. 5-3 was the final score, the loss for Indiana State to Florida State. Florida State had the early lead. Or not Florida State, Indiana State had the early lead before the Seminoles finally battled back to win it. It's a tough task to come into your first World Series, as we talked before, and have to go against the number one team in the nation right off the bat. Location with that pitch, and it's one and two. One ball, two strikes, nobody out. A couple of singles, two men on here for the Sycamores in the bottom of the first. Gary Ward has been here six consecutive times, but 1981, his first trip here was their best finish under his direction. They finished second. Cowboys won the national championship back in 1959. Curveball to second. Espinal to Ferris on the first. Berrigan there for the double play. Two outs, the runner at third. This starts with the pitcher. This is a good pitch he makes to Paul Fry. Gets the ball down, breaking down, and away. And all Fry can do is try to go the other way with it. And he hits a perfectly made double play ball to Espinal. And they turn it over. And credit Berrigan. He had to go down and dig it out of the dirt for his coach to complete that double play. But leaves a runner at third, two outs for Boy Rodriguez, who will now bat. The cleanup hitter. 319 coming into the game with 16 home runs and 58 RBIs. Only Paul Fry has more among the Sycamores. He bats from the left side. He was 0 for 4 on Saturday, and they're going to try to pitch him away, it looks like. Right on the outside corner. If he can throw the breaking ball out there, he won't have a lot of problems with these left-handed hitters. The other thing that I think we're learning here by watching these young men on a continuing basis is you have to watch them once you get into the sixth and seventh innings because things can start to change. I think that's been the one thing that I've seen that I wasn't aware of before we got here is the fact that none of the pitchers seem to be able to go nine innings. I don't know the reason. Maybe it's they use up a lot of energy, mental energy along the way or what, but they seem to have problems once they get into the seventh inning. But here again, that's maybe that's just normal in baseball now. Outside, it's one and two. Because in the major leagues, they have all these relief specialists, so very few guys go nine innings. But the problem in college baseball is they do not have a goose gossage or somebody to walk in and finish it up all the time. And of course, the folks at Miami would argue that point with you because they have Rick Rayler. Yeah, they and do. And then have. the other exception to what you're saying is a team like uh, uh, Florida, State. Florida State. They come in with 20 
complete, complete game. game. Maybe they go to the right spring training place. <laughs> <laughs> They're in Florida already. Yeah, maybe that warm weather has something to do with it, huh? Two balls, two strikes, two outs, runner at third. In the bottom half of inning number one. The runner at third is Zion. He's singled to start the bottom of this inning. Roman followed with a base hit, but then Paul Fry bounced into a double play. Rodriguez trying to drive in that first run. And get the Sycamores the lead. Chains Pops up. it up into shallow left center field. Anthony Blackman puts it away. A couple of hits, but no damage in the bottom half of the inning. No scores. We go to the second. And for the Cowboys, we'll go to work on the middle of the order. We have played one inning in game six of the 1986 NCAA College World Series. No score. The Cowboys of Oklahoma State brought their fans from Stillwater here. Look great in orange and black. Well, this for the Cowboys of the Big Eight. I always had a special fondness for orange and black. Those were my high school colors. Oh, it was. I only got fond of it when I played for the Giants. <laughs> I always thought it was ugly before that. <laughs> Ground ball, foul outside at first. In 81, I played for the San Francisco Giants, and they had orange uniforms at home and the black tops, you know, black tops and orange tops on the road. So we switched off every once in a while. Uh, I have noticed around the major leagues, there's a lot of talk. Many of the teams are going to go to new uniforms next year, and there's going to be a lot of changes back to more traditional styles, I think. Well, I always liked the traditional style of uniform anyway. I've always thought that the Dodger uniform was a traditional type uniform and similar to Indiana State, the colors, their road uniforms. So I always liked the traditional type myself. But I think there's something nice about the brightness of that orange, especially when you're talking a college sport. Well, I, I agree with that, too. I think it's great for college because there is a lot more excitement and brighter. It's a whole different thing. So I think it does fit in with the college scheme. That's the thing we have to keep in mind. College baseball is college baseball. Right. Kiflin the swing and a miss. He's down on strikes. That's three in a row for Gardner. And let's go down to Irv Brown. Irv? Gardner looks pretty good. Hey, you know, you know this guy, Gary Ward from Ramona, Oklahoma. They're all watching there. Had a decision to make a few years ago, John. Do you go baseball or basketball? Because he was an excellent basketball coach. And it just reminds me who used to coach basketball at Indiana State. Coach baseball, I should say, at Indiana State. Fellow by the name of John Wooden, 1948. It's a good thing he went basketball. And Gary, Gary, Gary Ward reminds me of a baseball coach, though. I think he's in his element. <laughs> Here's Jimmy Berrigan, 423 season average for Jimmy. Takes ball one, one for four in the first game last night. This young man has 23 home runs. He has College World Series experience, obviously. He was kind of the backup power for Pete Incavilia last night for the, or last year, rather, for the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. Six consecutive years. They have the longest current string in college baseball for making it to the NCAA College World Series. Lifts it into left field. A little help from the wind, and Burke will go to the warning track, move up, and make the catch. He hit it pretty well, but he got it up in the air. Yeah, the ball to go out here tonight is going to have to be more of a line drive type of a hit. Here's his swing. I think he gets a little bit out front. Yes, he does. As you see, he had to reach for that pitch a little bit. He got a little bit on his front foot and his heel, and the ball was away, so he had to actually reach for it. They listed the wind at 5 to 10, but I think it's a little higher than that. Straightening the flag out pretty good right now, blowing in from the northeast. That was a decision before the game Gary Ward made to start Adam Smith instead of Carlos Diaz. Adam Smith did pinch hit last night, but he decided to go with the left-handed batter and put Adam Smith in the lineup which basically changes his lineup because Carlos Diaz bats in the number nine spot. When he brings Smith in, he moves a left-hander up and changes things around a little bit. Well, the one thing I've noticed here is that he's got three left-handers, actually five counting the two switch hitters in the lineup. He was trying to go with an all-left-handed lineup because I guess he felt that they handled his lineup too easily the first ball game of the World Series, so he wanted to change and give him something else to look at. But I was at the game where Carlos Diaz hit two home runs, and I kind of like him. 
just down a little bit. It is three and one. Home plate umpire is Bob Nelson. Calling the balls and strikes tonight. Two outs, nobody on. Gardner has retired five in a row. There is a Gardner, and then there's Gardiner. And this is Gardiner on the staff, so it's three and two now. That's the one thing that happens when a guy is doesn't have an overpowering fastball. He'll give you a high pitch, and you think you can hit it, but you can't catch up with that high fastball, as you'll see here. It's high out of the strike zone, but you see that high fastball so good that you want to attack it. The fastball down and on the outside, just fouled it off. John Gardner is the other pitcher that is the name similar to Mike Gardner, who is pitching here tonight. Full count with two outs, nobody on. Top of the second, no score from Omaha, Nebraska, game six. Cutting it off is Buell, goes to Gardner, and it's another one, two, three inning. The first six Cowboys have been retired. We'll move to the bottom half of inning number two. Indiana State and Oklahoma State scoreless. Travis, Lexa, Everly when we come back. We're underway in the bottom half of inning number two. No score between Oklahoma State and Indiana State. They didn't wait for us. It's already one and one on the batter. Dave Travis, who is opening up this inning. The designated hitter with a 301 average. Team batting average for Indiana State is 321. They average seven runs a game. Dave looking for his first hit here in Omaha, Nebraska. Chops it up the middle. Espinal behind second on the first in time. What we see here with Robbie Walton is that he throws from the opposite side of the mound, which is unusual. Usually a right-hander will work from the other side of the mound so he can get a crossfire effect on the right-handed hitters and have the breaking ball going down and away. You get less break on the ball, less angle to throw the break on the fat on the breaking ball from the angle that he's using, from the side of the rubber that he's using. He will now face Mike Lexa, the second baseman. Bare hand play on the first two down. So that time Rob had himself in good position to make the play on that ball. Rob, actually Mike Letka. Alexa squared around too far, too quickly. I mean, you could see he showed bunt right away. See, he shows bunt right away. He's waiting. He has to wait for the pitch. And that allows the pitcher and the third baseman to charge a little bit. Two outs quickly here in the second inning. Mike Everly, the catcher, is the batter with his 315 average. 14 home runs in the number seven spot in the batting order. That's second on the team. Breaking ball caught the corner. It's one and one. Robbie Walton throws all the pitches, fastball, curveball, slider, and a change. And he has pretty good command of all. He'll use any in any situation. He'll throw anyone on 3-2, anyone on 2-0. and oh. Outside, it's two balls and one strike. Only one of the first six batters has hit the ball in the air. All the others have been on the ground. Good location with that fastball. Two and two. A guy that doesn't have a good fastball, or I shouldn't say a good fastball, a high speed fastball, has to make sure that he gets it on one edge of the plate or the other. He can't throw it down the middle. Change up. Now there are some horses in college baseball that will go to that trough and take care of that in a hurry if you throw it down the middle. Exactly. <laughs> Another good crowd on hand in Omaha, Nebraska, Rosenblatt Stadium tonight. Not as many as we had for Saturday's action. And we were near capacity, over 14,000. A little more in the 11,000 range tonight. Maybe 12. But the action really just heating up here in Omaha. Single games coming up Monday and Tuesday, another doubleheader Wednesday. Single game Thursday, doubleheader Friday. Hope you'll be here for all the action because all the games will be televised live. On one hot to the shortstop. Ferris to Berrigan. 
Three ground balls, three outs. We'll go to the third. Still no score between Oklahoma State and Indiana State here in Omaha, Nebraska. Wilkinson, Costco, Blackman, when we return. <laughs> Theme comparisons, you see the records, the batting average is a little edge to Oklahoma State. Home runs a big edge to the Cowboys. More on that later. Pitching staff's fairly similar there. Stolen bases, Oklahoma State runs more. Errors, an edge there to Indiana State. The Cowboys have their fans from the Stillwater area. A lot of those people would be from Omaha, and they've followed Oklahoma State for years. After all, they've been here six straight times. Looking at those comparisons you showed on the screen, it tells me two things. They better try to keep Oklahoma State from hitting the ball out of the ballpark, and they better try to keep them off the bases. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike Gardner has a tough job in front of him. He has done both thus far. Retired the first six batters, and he's ahead in the count to Scott Wilkinson. 0-2. No balls, two strikes. That's Scott. a good curveball there. I compared when I watched Mike Loin's curveball last night and now watching Mike Gardner's. Irv? John, both pitchers, 86 velocity. What's interesting, Oklahoma State looks flat to me on the bench. They need something to fire them up a little bit. Uh, maybe that has no bearing. I want to get Joe's comment, but they just don't look like they're really with it. It does have a bearing, Ed, Irv, and I was thinking the same thing. I was saying, this is not the same team I saw when I televised the game from Oklahoma State. They do not seem to have the same energy walking to the plate or energy in the field. Hot shot to third. Boy, Rodriguez stays with it. Nice play at third by Rodriguez. So seven in a row set down by Mike Gardiner. <laughs> See, the people from Texas are here anyway. And their fans in Omaha do miss the folks from Austin. Here is Brian Costco, just a point under 300, a freshman. A lot of baseball background in this young man's family. Interesting thing, John, I played with his father, Andy Costco. He played with the Cincinnati Reds when I was there. Andy was a big guy and could hit the ball 9,000 miles. Speaking of former players' sons, Barry Bonds just joining the Major League roster of the Pirates, and that brings the number currently of former College World Series, NCAA College World Series players in the Major Leagues, on the Major League rosters, to 67. Well, that makes the College World Series really a minor league for the big leagues. <laughs> and draft day is tomorrow for Major League Baseball, and certainly some of these young men that you will see and have seen will be among those names called as the major league players, major league teams, stock their farm systems. I knew it was time for me to retire, John, when I started looking around the major leagues and I saw uh, Schofield over at California, Stan Javier's son, Stan Javier at Oakland. Uh, I saw all these young guys coming up and I played against their father, uh, Danny Tartagul in Seattle. I played against all these guys. I said, I played against their fathers. It's about time for me to retire. <laughs> Two balls and two strikes on Costco. Full count of three and two. One of the most interesting things that happened in spring training was the fact that Hal McCray and his son actually played in the same game in spring training. That's amazing. And I played with Hal in Cincinnati in 72, and his son Brian was just a little tyke then. <laughs> did he go? No, he did not. Yes, he did. <laughs> I beg to differ there. But. All right. I think he swung at that pitch. Well, once again, you don't have a boat. <laughs> All right. But I have an opinion. That's correct. <laughs> Watch here. All right, you tell me whether he swings or not. You tell me. Maybe well, I'm wrong. <laughs> but he did swing. There was the appeal. The third base umpire, Dan Peterson, said no. We have now polled half the umpires. They're in agreement. <laughs> the man's at first. So I'm wrong. <laughs> Anthony Blackman. 241 batting average, just a couple of home runs. Cowboys have had a lot of success, as we mentioned, in the stolen bases. Uh, 145 out of 174. They're either picking their spots right or, or something, because that's an excellent percentage. Or they're just real good base dealers. And as you know, Gary Ward lets them all run on their own. And then he claims that his team has no speed. 
I don't think Gary Ward would be happy with the 1927 Yankees. He'd say <laughs> something is wrong. Or I should say the 1976 Reds. I don't think, I think he'd find something wrong with one of those teams. He's, he's a perfectionist, which is obviously good, especially for young players, because he's trying to teach them everything he possibly can. He does not want them to be one-dimensional players. So I think he has an excellent attitude for a college baseball coach. Costco is the first base runner for the Cowboys, and the last time Gardner pitched in this ballpark against Creighton, he threw a one-hitter. There's a call strike. Herb Brown? Hey, Joe Morgan, they're taking him deeper into the count. He's thrown more pitches in this inning than he has in the previous two. I think Gary Ward had a little team meeting early because I think he's sensing that they might be a little flat, and they're taking some strikes or making them work harder. That's good, and I, I think that's one of the things that they needed to do. Because his team, that's one of the problems with guys that hit home runs. They're usually free swingers. And they'll end up swinging at a lot of bad pitches and not make the pitcher work. And as we talked about earlier, you need to make these starting pitchers work a little bit because they cannot take it through the seventh inning normally. Up to high, it's three balls and one strike. Would not it follow, Joe, and also Herb, that because of the fact that Jerry Ward is a great uh, teacher of the zone theory of distant hitting that they should take more pitches. They, that was one of the things that surprised me when I talked to him earlier in the year that he does have, he is a great exponent of the zone theory and of discipline. But when I watched his team play, they attacked the ball until they got behind. And then he made them start taking pitches like he's doing now, I believe. Full count of three and two on Anthony Blackman, top of the order to follow, or Sergio Espinal in the on-deck circle. And the one thing I want to point out when I say that these starting pitchers only go into the seventh inning, that's not a criticism. I'm saying that because these guys are still developing. They're young guys. They have not developed the arm strength or the upper body strength to be able to throw nine innings. So I think it's something that just goes with the game. It's like your little leaguers can't throw the seven inning ball game. So it's not really a criticism. It's a fact because of that. Runner going, strike out at the plate, the out at second. Strike him out, throw him out, the double play takes care of the Cowboys, and through the first three innings, Gardner has faced a minimum of nine batters. No scores. We go to the bottom half of inning number three. The Cowboys, Oklahoma State, zero, and Indiana State, zero. Buell, Burke, and the top of the order coming up for the Sycamores. Here's the last out. And with that, we are still scoreless in Omaha, Nebraska. Good defense will help you every time. In addition to the good pitching, there's the strikeout. Now here comes Everly. Everly, is so far, he has been the best defensive catcher, I think, that I've seen here in the College World Series. That was a very close play. Costco couldn't believe it. Let's see it again on the swipe tag. See if that left foot gets in there. I'm not going to say anything. It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to question the umpire. All righty. Hank Roundtree said, you're out. And the inning is over with the strikeout and the... Caught stealing, the double play to end the inning. I think you were overvoted that time. That's right. <laughs> Here's Jeff Buell. We talked about this young man at the start of the game because the numbers aren't that big. And let's be realistic about it. In college baseball, uh, especially with the diversity and competition that you face, uh, to hit 300 is not that unusual. No, the guys that are real good hitters are going to hit over 350, and even as much as 450. The ones that are excellent hitters. So you should not be shocked if you'll see numbers like we have here, 368, 397. On the other side of the ledger, we have 461, 423. Many of the colleges and universities that are not quite at the level, especially the depth level of the College World Series teams, uh, get into their pitching staffs, and it can be bombs away time. Well, it's kind of similar to the way baseball used to be played in the major leagues. They would leave a guy out there and give up 20 runs because they didn't have specialized relief pitchers and stuff. And I think that's one of the problems with some of the smaller colleges. They do not have the depth to have specialization in their pitching staffs. One and two on Jeff Buell. That was an excellent pitch there. Excellent pitcher's pitch. Nobody out, nobody on. Bottom of the third, no score. Just stays alive. It's a foul ball. 
The catcher Adam Smith couldn't find it for a moment as it kicked away from home plate, but it was out of play. The last catcher to make All-American for Oklahoma State was Robbie Wine. You know his father. Right, his father was actually the manager of the Atlanta Braves last year, you know, until the season was over, the interim manager for a while. He finished the season as the manager of the Atlanta Braves. And we're talking of Bobby Wine. And I also played against him when I was in Is there anybody the major who didn't league. play? I know, that's <laughs> what I, I, I'm beginning to wonder how old I really am. Payoff pitch. Oh! All four. So Walton with his first walk. Sycamore's had two hits to start the bottom of the first inning. That ends a string of four in a row that had, or rather five in a row that had been retired by Rob Walton. And back to T.J. Burke now. T.J. with a couple of hits in Saturday's game. Batting 327 on the season. Runner at first is Jeff Buell. A leadoff walk here in the third inning. The number eight man getting aboard for T.J. Burke and then the top of the order to follow as the Sycamores try to go to work for Coach Bob Warren. Single games coming up on ESPN Monday and Tuesday. As we move back to the winner's bracket, the first team eliminated this year was Maine. The Black Bears of Coach John Winkin will be heading back to Orono, but not without a battle. He went down today by a score of 8-4, to four, and they lost a heartbreaker to Arizona on Friday. And we certainly want to thank the folks at Maine for sending us the lobsters. It was a special treat for the entire crew last night. Our guys have worked hard here for three days, and they enjoyed the lobster as always. It was delicious. I haven't worked hard, but I enjoyed the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always great to have the folks from Orono here and work with Dr. Winken. Tremendous job he does year in and year out. It's always a feeling of sadness, too, when we lose that first team. It is, and I am especially sad for John Winking because I was very impressed talking to him. He is really concerned with these kids, and he will not let his pitchers pitch over a certain amount of, throw it over a certain amount of pitches. He does not want to hurt their arms and hurt their chances of becoming major league players. And he is just really concerned, and he's got over 40 years of experience in coaching. So he really loves his job, and he loves these kids. So. I, I was really kind of sad to see him lose because I was very impressed with his attitude toward college baseball. Fouled back. He got beat by a couple of good teams. Arizona first of all and then LSU today. And of course the Fighting Tigers of LSU highly ranked coming in. Setting the stage for a potential rematch with Florida State possibly if Miami can knock off the number one team in the country. Of course look at it the other way. LSU's got or Florida State's got to knock off the defending champion. So there's a lot of good baseball teams left and a lot of good baseball coming up on ESPN. Again it's fouled away and the count remains one and two. I think Robbie Walton has TJ overmatched here. He can't get to the high fastball and he's having trouble with the low curveball. So he's got him a little bit overmatched. Only two hits in the game. Both belong to Indiana State. Popped it up. Shortstop out is Monty Ferris. One up. And you can now hear the wind whipping up. It's pretty strong right now. Might blow up a little rain, although they say there's a very slim chance of it. It is expected to cool down tonight. That's why we've had the wind from the north and the northeast. It was very warm, probably the warmest day of the year so far in Omaha this afternoon as we got up into the mid 80s, upper 80s. Bob Zion got an infield single as he hit the ball to deep short his first time up. Got as far as third with two outs but could not score. Jeff Buell walked to begin the inning. He's there with one out now. Move to first. See the difference in the uniform numbers. 
in Oklahoma State and Indiana State? Indiana State is new here. They want to make sure everyone knows who they are. They have beautiful uniforms. Ground ball to first base. They'll go to second for one. Back to first. Not in time. That was an excellent play by Jimmy Berrigan because the runner was going and he had to get rid of that ball very quickly. But in doing so, he did not get back to the bag quick enough. Watch. He comes off the bag, makes an excellent play. As you see, the runner's going. He throws the second, but he does not get back to the bag. Otherwise, I think they could have had a double play here. Of course, the 3-6-3 three, three double play is one of the toughest. It's one of my favorites. I like the 3-6-1 double play. It really shows your pitchers in the ballgame. Right, but the 3-6-3 three, three double play is probably the toughest one to complete. Two outs for Dan Roman. He got a base hitter. Hey, Joe, how important is this? The shortstop just gives it behind the glove. I got it, you take it. Something that doesn't show up in the box score, and yet if you mess it up, the ball's going into center field. What they do there is usually your most experienced player will give the signal, and he'll give it a close, meaning me, I'll take it. Open mouth is you, you take it on the steal. You always tell the pitcher who's going to cover on a ground ball back to the pitcher. But on the stolen base, you yell who's going to cover. That way you can leave a hole open only on one side instead of both of you not knowing who's covering and both of you break for the bag. And all you have to do, it's very simple. It only takes a second. You just put your glove up to your face, turn and look, and get the signals done, right? And you put your glove up to your face because you want to hide it from the coaches because if the coaches know who's covering on a steal, they'll tell the hitter, and the hitter knows which hole to shoot it to. And have to throw the first. It's another one of the little intricate games that go on within a baseball game. You have to guess. One of the toughest things for me to do was to try to decide who was covering when a guy like Pete Rose was hitting when I was playing against him or Clemente. Some of those guys, you never know where they're going to hit the ball. And you saw the sign right there. It's hit on the ground to short. Ferris fights it, stays with it, throws the first too late. It'll be an error on Monty Ferris. Keeps the Sycamores alive here in the third inning. It's a hard ground ball that has a lot of overspin on it. See, he hits the top of that curveball. It has a lot of overspin on it. It just jumps up on Ferris. I thought he should have held the ball because the only thing you can do here is throw the ball away because you have no chance of getting the guy. That's one of the things that makes playing shortstop the toughest position to play on the infield because usually if you fumble a ball at shortstop, it's an error. At second base and third base, you can knock the ball down, still have plenty of time to pick it up and throw the guy out. But shortstop is the toughest place to play because you have to catch most of the balls clean in order to make a play. Second time in the ball game, the Sycamores have had two runners in an inning. They had two on, nobody out of the first. Now with Zion at second, Roman at first, it's up to Paul Fry. Paul grounded into a double play his first time up. Batting here with two on and two out. A chance for Indiana State to crack through and take the lead. struck out anyone and he has walked one to an oath he seems to be not as effective from a stretch by that I mean he doesn't get the ball down as well and out of the stretch as he does from the windup a lot of people pitchers have a tendency to have that problem from the windup they're able to bend better from the stretch they don't seem to bend their backs good enough to get the ball down pops it up Berrigan to the dugout, can't make the play. It's in the dugout. See, even hung that curveball. But from a windup, he's been able to get the breaking ball down. I think a lot of pitchers, that's one thing a lot of young pitchers have to learn. There is a difference throwing from the stretch as opposed to from the windup. A lot of people say, well, you get yourself in the same position. That's true. But the preliminary things you do sometimes cause you to stand more upright when you throw from the stretch than from the windup. And of course, there are a lot of relief pitchers who've eliminated the problem. They simply don't pitch from the full windup. And anymore. they know what they're supposed to do. They have their mechanics right from the stretch, so they continue to throw from the stretch. Tom Seaver's a great example of a guy that gets down 
from the windup. He drags his knee, his back knee. Runners going as it's fouled back again. Often moving with the pitch were Bob Zion and Dan Roman, but they'll have to back up again. Coach Gary Ward trying to win this one. Get his team back on track in the 1986 NCAA College World Series. We are in Omaha, Nebraska. I think Gary's trying to figure out how to get some offense right now. <laughs> he says he leaves the pitching to his pitching coach. Called strike on the corner and the inning is over. Two men left on base here in the third inning. No run scored for Indiana State. Still 0-0 between the Cowboys and the Sycamores as we move to the top half of inning number four for Espinal, Ferris, and Ventura. Second time around coming up against Indiana State and Coach Bob Warren. The sun is going down on day three of the 1986 NCAA College World Series, and as it sets on game six, we're scoreless. We have played three so far in Omaha, Nebraska, 37 consecutive years. This beautiful city has hosted the young men from all around the country in this eight-team double elimination tournament. We're off to another great start as far as attendance and competition is concerned here in 1986. Top of the order, Sergio Espinal popped up to third base his first time up. Four strikeouts thus far for Gardner. One walk. And the Pokes are still looking for their first poke. They do not have a hit in the ball game. He's throwing a good curveball. There it is again. It's on two. His strikeout percentage in the first three innings not quite as high as Robbie Walton, but he has thrown eight fewer pitches. when you have a lot of wind at the ballpark, especially when it's blowing in or out. When the wind is blowing in as it is tonight, I don't really think it helps a breaking ball pitcher. It helps a fastball pitcher. When the wind is blowing out, it helps a breaking ball pitcher because he's throwing and he gets the rotation and that wind helps it break down. I remember trying to hit Juan Marichal in Candlestick Park when the wind was blowing out to right field. He would throw that big curveball and it would come right off the table. Kind of like that. That's yeah. A little too low. It's ball one. Yeah. But it's, I think the advantage is only for a power pitcher, a guy that throws hard. But it really hurts, I think, a breaking ball pitcher more than that it will help him. Ferris struck out his first time up. It's a two hopper to Roman. A short. On the Buell. Two outs. We're in the fourth inning. The other thing you have talked about as we've been here, we get the outstanding help, of course, from the Omaha Police Department and the security folks right up on the roof in Rosenblatt Stadium. You talked about how shallow the outfielders play. Of course, tonight with that wind blowing in, it gives you the opportunity probably to do that. If it's a fly ball, you can catch up with it. Being honest, they're playing exactly the same spots anyway. <laughs> but uh, I have still definitely been surprised at how shallow they were playing because a lot of these guys have, have power, and especially in the alleys. So when you play shallow, it really cuts off any chance of you cutting down balls that are hit in the alley. Call strike to Ventura. You talk about power. I'll show you power, and when, especially when we're talking about Oklahoma State, because they have some awesome numbers in terms of home runs, especially in the Grand Slam home run department. Ten Grand Slams this season. Nine different players have hit home runs. One player, the one at the plate, has hit two. And they actually... In one game against the University of Kansas, hit two Grand Slam home runs in the same inning. Well, they're, Ouch. <laughs> they're definitely a power hitting ball club. But I also have to add to that is that that ballpark yeah, at Oklahoma camera. State in Stillwater is a good home run hitters ballpark. And you watch, it's like in the major leagues, you see a place like Yankee Stadium and a left-handed hitter that hits a lot of home runs there may not be as powerful as a left-handed hitter that hits the same amount of home runs in a ballpark like, say, uh, Kansas City. So the ballpark has a lot to do with that. And that may be one of the reasons that Oklahoma State has not been able to win the College World Series, even though they get here, is because this is a bigger ballpark, and when you depend 
on your home run. You live or die by the home run. Sometimes you die in the, against good teams. Two balls and two strikes on Robin Ventura. Full count of three and two. As a matter of fact, Coach Gary Ward admitted as much to us in talking about some of his power hitters. He say away from Reynolds Stadium and Stillwater, they don't have that kind of power. Right, and I have to agree, and I'm seeing that more and more as we watch them in these two ball games here at Omaha. Fouled back. The Cowboys, even without Pete in Cabilia, are within two home runs of their all-time school record for a single season. They have traditionally had plenty of offense. Foul tip, he holds on. Six strikeouts in the first four innings for Mike Gardner. And he has held the Cowboys from Stillwater, Oklahoma, hitless. To go to the bottom of the fourth inning, still no score. Game six of the 1986 NCAA College World Series. Stay with us. We'll be right back to Omaha. wondered if people who wave at the camera think that anybody even knows who they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they all do it. There's a little delay here because Gary Ward has spent some time with the NCAA committee and all rulings and the tournament is actually run by this committee. There's Jerry Miles to the left. Herb Brown will check that out to see what the conversation is about. The tournament committee does have a box right near the third base dugout, and they rule on all disputes, decisions, and have the final word. I think he just wanted clarification of something. He didn't seem to be that upset to me, but you never can tell with Gary Ward. But he didn't seem to be that upset. I think he just wanted to rule or something. The number four hitter, Boy Rodriguez, will start it off. Tries to bunt a breaking pitch. Yes, he did try to bunt it to strike. I changed my mind. You should ask. <laughs> well, last night you just I said, <laughs> hey, man, I changed my mind. But that was very obvious that he tried to bunt, and the home plate umpire couldn't see that. He was screened off. Right. Well, one thing I like about you, Joe, you're easy. You change your mind. <laughs> last night you went into this huge debate about why you don't like the appeal call. And well, I was thinking when I was hitting. See, I didn't like to be able to appeal. Now I changed my mind. You have to also remember, I'm new at this. I've got a right to change my mind. Of course. <laughs> one and one. High fly ball center field. Wilkinson drifting in. One up. As I've said on several occasions, and you see a lot of breaking ball pitches here in this tournament, it's not always the break in the ball that gets the hitter out. A lot of times it's the speed of the pitch that fools him. And if you watch, most of these guys are out on their front foot, and that's why they're hitting a lot of fly balls and pop-ups, because they're out on their front foot and they're fooled, and they're off balance, and they swing and pop that pitch up. What was the key for you to being able to hit the, the breaking ball? What did you have to learn to do? I had to keep from collapsing that front side. Line drive at the first baseman, Berrigan up the ladder to make the play, two outs. You have to keep from collapsing the front side. It doesn't matter if you get out on your front foot, but you have to keep from... Just kind of stuck out his bat and took a swipe at a ball down and away. Jimmy Berrigan reacting quickly for the second out. What I was saying is you have to... You can get out on your front foot. As you know, one of the greatest... The greatest home run hitter of all time, Hank Aaron, used to hit off his front foot a lot but he kept that front side firm. And then you can you keep your bat back, and then you have a lot of bat speed left. What happens here is when your front side breaks down, you have no bat speed left, and that's why they're hit, just hitting a lot of easy pop-ups. There's a hot shot up the middle. No pop-up there. A sharp single to center field. Third hit in the ball game for the Sycamores of Terre Haute, Indiana. Mike Lexa picking up his first NCAA College World Series base hit. Jimmy Berrigan will hold him on. So with two outs, he's aboard, and it's Mike Everly, the catcher. Mike grounded out his first time up. We're in the bottom of the fourth. Three hits for Indiana State. The Cowboys have no hits, no runs. Neither team able to score thus far. But as we have seen in the first three days of this 
championship event that can change in a hurry. There's a little difference in Rob Walton's curveball and Mike Loins last night. But I, Mike Loins did not have a hump in it. Robbie Walton's has a hump in it. What I mean a hump, the ball actually starts up out of his hand and then breaks down. The good curveball starts on one trajectory and just goes straight down. It doesn't have a hump in it. Is there more danger of hanging the one that has the hump in it? Yes. <laughs> very much so and that's why he's hung a few tonight but he's gotten away with it so far catcher sets up outside it's the fastball right on the corner excellent location that time you can throw that pitch in that spot that will certainly help the curve huh exactly the curveball coming off the fastball is very effective because of here again it's the speed differential that makes a big difference as well if the break doesn't get you the speed will Alexa back easily. No balls and two strikes on Mike Everly. Two outs here in the fourth inning. It's the bottom of the fourth. No score. Run production down in the 1986 NCAA College World Series. As a matter of fact, they've been averaging 7.6 runs a game, both team combined. And the eight teams have a combined batting average of 263. So some of the offense has gone out of the attacks of these teams that they have come here actually from what I've seen also John is I think you have to give a lot more credit to the pitching that we've seen the pitchers that I've seen not only are they able to throw the breaking ball for a strike but they seem to be a lot more poised a lot more in control out there and a better knowledge of pitching than you normally I would think you would find in just another college situation. These guys all, so far, the ones that I've seen, all seem to have a good idea about how to pitch, moving the ball around, changing speed. They seem to understand what pitching is all about. We have had eight home runs thus far, two of them in the game prior to this one, the LSU main game. Fighting Tigers hit a couple of home runs. The other six home runs all came in the same game. And that was that dramatic Arizona main game. The Black Bears hit three, and the Wildcats hit three. I guess you can summarize the difference by saying that Maines were all solo home runs, but Arizona home runs were all two-run homers. It does make a difference. <laughs> Everly looking at one-two pitch. It's outside runner going through the second in plenty of time. Mike Lex is cut down, trying to steal for the sixth time this year. So the inning is over. We have played four in Omaha, Nebraska. Still no score between Oklahoma State and Indiana State. Diplin, Berrigan, and Adam Smith coming up. Let's go back and take a look at the final out of the inning. Excellent throw coming up from Adam Smith. We'll be back to Omaha. And, uh, he is well remembered quite fondly here in Omaha, Nebraska for his time spent here. And believe me, he spent some time here. <laughs> I think they've decided to put the NCAA College World Series on the regular season schedule in Stillwater from now on. <laughs> Jim Iplin struck out his first time up. Six strikes out, strikeouts so far for Gardner. One strikeout into a double play. We've had a couple runners caught stealing. The Miami Maniac is uh, taking time off to work upstairs, but there's nobody up there. He was reading the paper in between innings. Must be in the front row, huh? <laughs> yeah. There's the first hit of the ball game for Oklahoma State. It comes in the fifth inning. Herb? John, you know, they finally get their first base knock. I've been taking a look at this ball club, wondering what they're missing. You know what they don't have? A guy we've seen forever. Doug Desenza. Remember how he worked the pitchers? He always had a throw from the hold on motion. He was always on base for Incavilla. They don't have a guy like that. He's with the Cubs now. You need the table setters, you know? Absolutely. Here's Jimmy Berrigan, who flied to left his first time up. One for five in his time so far in Omaha, Nebraska, which they hope to extend because if you lose this one, you can rack the bats for another season. 
LSU has eliminated Maine. The loser of this game will go home. And then we'll move back into winner's bracket action coming up live on ESPN Monday and Tuesday. The game on Monday, Loyola Marymount against Arizona. Sam Rosen, Rick Wolf, and Irv Brown will be there for that one. Joe Morgan will get a well-deserved day off. And then it's Miami and Florida State on Tuesday, live, 8 o'clock on ESPN, as Bob Warren goes to the mound now to have a little conversation. Just to find out the situation. They've just gotten their first hit, and it's a two-ball, no-strike count. What is he saying to him, Joe? You know, when I used to go to the mound, everyone always thought I went in with words of wisdom and whatever. I used to go in just to give the pitcher a breather. I'd go in, the first thing i say, I'm not coming in here to tell you how to pitch or anything like that. I just want you to back off, start the inning all over, forget about the fact that you've made a couple of mistakes, just start the inning over and let's go from here. Were there ever any real weird conversations that would go on on the mound, like the guy would say, listen, when we get to Chicago, we're going here after the game or anything like that? No, I, I was started to the mound the first time when Tom Seaver came over from the Mets to pitch for the Reds, and he got in a little trouble. I started for the mound, and he looked at me, and he says, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Tom, I just came in to give you a breather. And Tom was a guy that always rushed. He always wanted to finish the hitter too quick. So after that, he really appreciated it, and he always looked for me to come in when he got to going too fast. Two balls and no strikes. Outside corner for a strike. It's two and one on Jimmy Berrigan. Runner at first. Oklahoma State trying to get something started against Mike Gardiner, the young man from Canada, who has been very effective. One hit into the fifth inning. Working behind now, three and one. And this is where the Cowboys can hurt you. Exactly. You cannot, as we said at the beginning of the ballgame, get behind these sluggers because it seems that that is part of their problem. They are trying, each guy is trying to get a pitch and hit it out of the ballpark. And they're all trying to do it all by themselves, and I don't think you can do that. And I don't think you can hit that pitch out of the park. <laughs> or at all. <laughs> Three and two. If you can't hit it, don't swing. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what Johnny Vick said. <laughs> I think Gary Ward will put the hit and run on in this situation because he's going to try to make something happen. Nope. Fouled out of play. I'm not going to listen to him again. <laughs> Irv Brown? I just talked to Bob Warren. I want to know what he had to say when he went out and talked to his pitchy gardener. He said, you've got great stuff where it's hurting you as you're falling behind, and uh, you've speeded it up a little bit. Slow down, go out and do the thing you can. They can't hit you. And after, actually, he's right. They've got one base knockoff, and he's been superb. That's what I used to tell him. 3-2 pitch. Fly ball into foul territory down the left field line. I don't think anybody will catch up with this one. Scoots into the stand. Capacity here in Omaha is 15,300. We had close to 15,000 for our second session on Saturday. Rally time in Omaha. Cowboy fans trying to get something started. I forgot. It is the fifth inning. A runner on, nobody out. All right, Jimmy Berrigan who has 23 home runs on the season. Swing and a miss, the runner going again. We've got it again, there's the double play. Second time in the ball game, the Cowboys have run into a double play. As I've said before, I, I really believe that Mike Everly is the best defensive catcher I've seen here. He sets up very well, gets rid of the ball very quickly, and he's got something on it. Watch where this throw is. Right over the bag, perfect. So call a score at 2-6 on the caught stealing, and it is the second time we've had a strike him out, throw him out, double play. Well, that'll take a load off the pitcher. What you've got is a lot of things have got to happen in that situation, Joe. First, you've got to get the strike out. Plus, there's still got to be a pitch that your catcher can handle, or it's got to be something that he can make a play on, or you've got to have a catcher like Everly who's good enough to well, handle it. Well, that's the point. Everly was good enough to handle it. That wasn't a perfect pitch to throw on. It was down. But he has made an excellent play. As I said, I think, and not just a little bit, I think by far he's the best defensive catcher here in the in the College World Series. Look how he crouches and he gets the pitch. See, he does move. I think that's the key. A lot of catchers move around back there. He sets up, catches the ball with his glove. He doesn't catch it with his body. He does not move and block the umpire out. I think he's going to be an excellent receiver for someone. Two balls and one strike to count. It's foul back. 
I would think also, Joe, in watching him for the last two nights, that he, for a pitcher, would be a delight to pitch to. Exactly. That's why I said when you get a lot of movement back there, it distracts the pitcher. They don't tell you that, but it distracts them. If you, all you can see is his glove moving, then that's what you pick up, and that's what you will throw to. Watch how he stays perfectly still. Ground ball to the first baseman. Buell will make the play by himself, and that's it. Cowboys get their first hit, but a double play takes care of that, and Oklahoma State does not score. We go to the bottom half of the fifth inning. Still no score between Oklahoma State and Indiana State. Sycamore's coming to... I've already, let's that say, signed my letter of intent to play for the Cowboys. And believe me, a lot of young men have and have benefited from playing for Coach Gary Ward. One that got away, we talk about Indiana State. Yes, Larry Bird did play a little bit of baseball for the Sycamores, but a fellow who had signed a letter of intent but then went pro is named Don Mattingly. And he is an exceptionally fine hitter, as we all know. <laughs> the Miami Maniac has made it all the way to our booth. Don't tip him, Joe. <laughs> Outside corner to Eberle. Aren't you supposed to be working? <laughs> <laughs> no balls and one strike. Into right center field. It'll drop for a base hit. Wilkinson there to hold him to a single. And that's the fourth hit of the ball game for the Sycamores from Terre Haute, Indiana. Mike Everly has hit safely in each of his first two games in the 1986 NCAA College World Series. This is our, our spotter <laughs> behind us here. Yeah. The guy that feeds us all of our information. And if we make mistakes, it's because he can't talk. We're not getting any information. <laughs> he was on the roof a second ago. Now he's in here. He's working his way down to the crowd. <laughs> a leadoff single in the bottom of the fifth inning sets it up for Jeff Buell. Jeff walks his first time up, takes a strike. He shows bunt. Now, one thing that Joe has already mentioned is the Sycamores will bunt 95% of the time in this situation. Being perfectly honest with you, the way the game is going, I would bunt as well because you have to try to get one run. And usually in an elimination situation, seventh game of the World Series or whatever, I think the team that scores first has a big edge. It puts a lot of pressure on the other guy. He pops it up, but it's back into the camera bay. Because as long as the game's tied, both teams feel like they have a chance to win. When one team goes ahead, it lifts their spirits and really kind of pushes the other ones down a little bit. So I would try to get a run any type of way I could from this point on in the ballgame, even to admit squeezing or doing something like that. Bob Warren, is he swinging away now at 0-2? I would think he is now because Jeff has done an excellent job for Indiana State in the playoffs, and you don't want to take the bat completely out of his hands. So I would think that he'd be swinging away now. One ball and two strikes. Defensively, the Cowboys turned double play in the first inning. Sycamores have come up with two double plays, both of them on a strikeout and the runner caught stealing. I think you could pick a pitch here and try to guess with Robbie Walton or when he's going to throw the breaking ball and maybe send the guy and try to get a hit and run going. Smith sets up inside. It's the breaking ball on the corner, and he rings him up. Second strikeout for Walton. It comes at a good time. I think Jeff is foolish here because it is a breaking ball, and he probably thinks it's going to break across and into him and move miss the corner, but it goes straight down and stays on the inside corner. That was a pitch that bothered me most when I was a hitter. The curveball, it broke straight down over the inside corner because I always felt like it was going to break inside, and I couldn't hit it. Line drive off the glove of Walton. No play. Everybody's safe. I'll tell you what, though, Walton's reacting, getting leather on it, saved the first and third situation, probably. It might have saved more than that. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was a bullet. It'll set your heart to pounding, won't it? <laughs> right, I guess the thing is, guys that don't throw real hard, you can't get the fastball in the middle of the plate. <laughs> well, you made that point earlier that it's not where you want it. No. It's real big. <laughs> and then the, the bad news is it comes right back at you. And if you're not in good fielding position, you can be in serious trouble. So the cow, uh, the uh, 
Sycamores have something started again. Second inning, they've had two hits. They have five in the game, but no runs to show for it. Walton has dodged the bullets thus far. We have activity in the Oklahoma State bullpen. Two pitchers are up and throwing. And he literally dodged the bullet there. Leadoff batter Bob Zion taking a good long look. We have a lefty-righty combination starting to warm up out there. Jimmy Long, number 12. There's a strike. I think the other one might have been uh, Steve Linhard. I was hoping that Joe Morgan could spot him without his... I was going to tell you, if I could see that far, I'd still be playing. 0-2 <laughs> oh on the batter. Two on. One out. Breaking ball stays up high. It's one and two. along with Jimmy Long. Down the left field line, but it will slice out of play. So the count remains a ball and two strikes. We still have two men on. And heading back to second base is Mike Everly. He's singled and moved up on the base hit by T.J. Burke. Those singles coming around. A strikeout of Jeff Buell. One out, two on. Indiana State, Oklahoma State in the loser's bracket, no score. Shakes off a couple of pitches. Let's see what the decision is. Popped it up on the left side into shallow left field. Blackman coming on, taking charge, two out. That was excellent pitching there by Robbie Walton. He had Bob looking for the breaking ball, and he kept feeding him the high fastball. And when you do that, you look for the breaking ball, you cannot hit the fastball. The rule of thumb is no matter what the count is, two balls, no strikes, whatever, you look for the fastball and adjust to the breaking ball. If you're looking for the fastball, you can always hit the slower pitch. But if you're looking for the slower pitch, you can't catch up with the fastball. And Tom Holliday, the pitching coach, will go to the mound. He and his brother Dave are the coaches plenty of experience because they were involved in Miami also at Arizona so a lot of experience gathered by coach Gary Ward of the bullpen he continues to throw but they are not on the mound they're actually throwing long right now I think they're just getting reasonably loose starting to stretch it out yeah so if they need them they can step up and throw about four pitches and be ready and the meeting and the center of the diamond continues. As we know, Gary Ward is very thorough, and he has a pitching pattern that he wants Robbie Walton to use on Danny Roman, so he probably sent Tom out to remind him of how they want to pitch to Danny Roman. Because in this situation, there are runners at first and second with two outs. Roman is three for six. Here in Omaha. This is the third time in the first five innings that the Sycamores have had a pair of runners on, but they have not been able to score. And that's what I meant earlier when I was talking about the poise of all the pitchers I've seen here at Omaha. These guys do not panic when they get guys on base, they just pitch a little better. Up too high. That's always the test you can use to tell whether a pitcher is a good, good pitcher or not, or just a thrower. Guys that anyone can pitch if no one gets on base. But what happens is when guys get on base and you're under pressure, do you make the good pitch then? There's a good pitch on the breaking ball. Drops in the strike zone. It's one and one. Robbie Walton trying to slings this breaking ball here, and that's why it stays so high. So he slings that a little bit, starts it on the inside part of the plate. He did not snap that one off like the one he did to Jeff Buell. There's another one. Again, it's up in the strike zone. And it's because I believe that he's throwing from the stretch. And I think that has a lot to do with it. It seems like a minor thing, but unless a pitcher actually knows that, he has to bend a little more from the stretch, he doesn't concentrate on it. 
Two on, two out, no score. Bottom half of inning number five. Whoop, up and in. Three and one. That was a real good example there of him not bending at all. And that's why the ball was released so high. And that is one of the things that as a pitcher comes with experience. Exactly. Three and one now. Good fastball. Right down Main Street that time. Full count, three and two. The thing I like about Rob Walton, he refuses to give in to these guys. Exactly. Watch this. He releases this fastball, and you can see him bend a little better. See how he follows through and throws a fastball right by him. He has a tendency to let his cap fly away at times, too, when he comes charging off the mound. Full count with two outs. That's very distracting to the hitter as well, because you're looking for a ball coming out of a certain zone. And if you see his hat fly, sometimes it'll distract you a little bit. I had that problem with a couple of guys. They used to, their hats used to fly off. And then Gaylord Perry used to do it intentionally. He'd do anything to win. Foul back. We'll do it all again. The runners, of course, on three and two were in motion. Fences here at Rosenblatt Stadium are 10 feet high. And then straightaway center, where they build up the hitting background, that's 20 feet. If you hit one over that one at 420, 20 feet high, They'll probably take you to the major leagues tomorrow. Yeah, that or they'll give you a saliva test. <laughs> they test this aluminum back for Clark, huh? <laughs> Three two pitch again. Hit to right field. Costco is there. The inning is over. So once again, a couple of runners stranded by the Sycamores, but they do not score in inning number five. We'll move on to the top half of the sixth inning, still scoreless in game six of the 1986 College World Series. And coming up, it's the bottom third of the order for Oklahoma State. Well, we played five, and the pitchers have it so far, 0-0. Zero, zero. Well, they both, Gardiner has thrown 74 pitches. And 61% of those have been strikes. Robbie Walton has thrown 84 pitches, and 65% of his have been strikes. So they're doing an excellent job. Wilkinson retired on a good play at third. He hit the ball hard, but boy, Rodriguez stayed with it back in the third inning and threw him out. Only one hit thus far for Oklahoma State. The Cowboys got that hit in the fifth inning. Jim Iplin got the hit and was retired on a attempted steal while the batter at the plate Jimmy Berrigan was striking out so through five Mike Gardiner has faced the minimum at the knees a striker Brown I want to talk to Joe about his buddy Gaylord Perry you know occasionally they said he wet one down Joe had an umpire tell me he used to go out to the mound to talk to Gaylord and smell like a medicine kit <laughs> <laughs> could you spot that spitter cupboard no <laughs> Ball driven deep into left center field. Zion on the move, runs it down. And the wind maybe knocked that one down a little bit, a little bit as Wilkinson got it up in the air. The wind, wind definitely kept that one from going farther than it went, John. Let's see how Scott. He's got a little hitch in his bat there, I think, which kept him from getting the head out a little quicker. But he hit the ball very sharply, but. The wind kept it in the ballpark. When I say a hitch, I mean he's got a little movement there that keeps his bat from going forward at the proper time. Ball one to the number eight batter. Brian Costco walked in the third, was caught stealing, while Anthony Blackman was striking out to end that third inning. Only two base runners for the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. And we're talking about a team here that is averaging over 11 runs a game. What is it they say about good pitching? I don't believe in it. <laughs> Irv, that reminds me, the story of Gaylord Perry reminds me, it's all the investment people were looking for Gaylord Perry. They were trying to figure out, they wanted a guy to work for him who could make a million dollars using one little can of Vaseline. <laughs> <laughs> he was amazing. Three balls and one strike. Did he allow the clubhouse people to clean his uniform? 3-1 <laughs> pitch is popped up. Up the chute, back 
comes Everly, but the ball will not come back enough. Pop up behind the plate, do come back, you know, toward the infield. That's because they get that opposite rotation on them, and they do come back. That's exactly correct. It's a full count of three and two on Brian Costco. The last time there was an average of runs between the two teams, this ball is fly down the left field line. A long way to go for T.J. Burke into the bullpen area, and it's out of play as he takes a look. The last time they averaged less than 8.9 runs per game between the two teams was 1973. So this kind of stuff. We have not had a double-figure game yet at an 8-7 game and an 8-4 game. Those are the two highest-scoring games we've had so far. And like I say, I don't attribute it to poor hitting. I just attribute it to good pitching. So maybe good pitching does stop good hitting. I told you you were easy. <laughs> Second time, Costco has walked in the game. Except when they were pitching to the Reds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends on which Reds. You're talking <laughs> mid-70s, you're yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. I think I could pitch to him now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait till I tell Pete Rose what you said. <laughs> well, my buddy Pete's having some problems over there in Cincinnati. I watched him yesterday get beat up bad. Blackman struck out his first time up, struck out into a double play as Costco, who is now the runner at first, was cut down at second. They asked me about Pete's philosophy as a manager, and I talked to him about it last year. And Pete's mo motto is, run everything out and be in by 12. <laughs> at the knees, the strike. No balls and one strike on the number nine batter, Anthony Blackman, still looking for his first hit in this 86 NCAA World Series. 0 for 4 now. One of three switch hitters in Coach Gary Ward's lineup. Cowboys 54 wins. And Gary Ward, listen to this, in nine years has won 447 games. Not bad for a guy who couldn't decide whether he wanted to be a basketball coach or a baseball coach. As I said, I think he made the right choice. Although Oklahoma State has a good basketball program as well. Absolutely. And their football program has really come on in recent years. No balls and two strikes with one out, one on. Top half of inning number six. Cowboys have but one hit, and they've only had three base runners. And each time that Gary Ward has started a runner, the runner has been cut down by the man behind the plate, Mike Everly. Not a big lead at first. He's running, strikeout. Throw to second. Three times that has happened in the game. Twice to Costco and Blackman combined. So through six. Only 18 Cowboys have gone to the plate. Still no score here in Omaha, Nebraska. Between the Cowboys and the Sycamores. Fry, Rodriguez, and Travis coming up. But let's take one more look here, Joe. He gets rid of the ball awfully quick. And it's right on the money again. Back with more baseball from Omaha, Nebraska, and the College World Series after this. Let's go back. We've seen it three times tonight, Joe. Yes, you'll see Eberly throw out the runner, but he almost doesn't make the play here because the shortstop takes too long to get the ball, the tag on him. Watch, he brings his whole body down to make the tag. And I'm not sure the runner wasn't safe, but all you have to do is bring your arm down. You don't bring your whole body down. You use your wrist, snap it down real quick, and catch the ball, snap it down. Yeah, he kind of slammed longer. it down with both hands. Right, he, he brought both his hands down. Obviously, you're quicker with one hand than you are with two. I always say you should use two hands to catch the ball, but to make a tag, you only need one. Eight Cowboys have struck out tonight. Ten of them went down on strikes on Saturday against Miami. Paul Fry now bats. He was grounded into a double play and struck out. 
So Oklahoma State has attempted to steal three bases by their three base runners tonight. They've all been caught stealing in double play situations and only 18 Oklahoma State batters have gone to the plate in the first six. There's a base hit. So Paul Fry, who did not get off to a good start tonight with the double play and the strikeout, comes up with a single. And it is hit number six for the Sycamores. I still think he's a good-looking hitter. I think I like the way he swings the bat. Watch here. Watch his balance. Once he starts the bat, there's no wasted motion. And he really whipped it through the strike zone. Indiana State trying to stay alive. And Boy Rodriguez, who is 0 for 2, he's flied out twice, will be the batter. They've had base runners in every inning but the second. And in three of the first five innings, they had two men on base. Up and away from Walton. See, there he goes with the high pitches again as soon as he gets into the stretch. If you just think about it, from the windup, he never misses that far high. But when he gets into the stretch, he doesn't quite bend quick enough. Behind him in the bullpen, it continues to be lefty-righty. I told you we might see Gordy Dillard. He is the left-hander. Steve Linhard is the right-hander, number 33. Those are the two pitchers loosening up behind this young man, Rob Walton. He's 22, a senior from Rutherford, New Jersey. 3-0. That's a tough pitch to throw, 2-0, when you miss so badly with the first two. He tried to throw him a changeup to keep him off balance. Well, a good perception on your part to pick up the difference in his pitching style because every time he does get a man on base, he immediately gets behind the next batter. Exactly. He's, he's just not bending properly. And from the wind up, he does. So it's something that, as you said, he'll learn and he'll correct. It's the bottom half of inning number six. After the fastball for a strike, three and one. Indiana State trying to load him up here. Do to follow. Travis and Lexa. That's Travis on the left, and there's Lexa on the right. Three and two. He did not throw that one down the middle. He throws a fastball on the inside. It's inside, actually, and then it tails back over the plate. Rodriguez can't believe it. It well, is a full count. I think he gave up on the pitch too soon. It was inside at one point, but it tailed back. Change Fly ball. ball right field. Drifting back is Costco to the warning track to the wall. Makes the catch. On another night. Yep. He threw that change up, and he fooled him just enough to keep him from hitting it on a line. Otherwise, it would have gone out of here. But he still hit the ball pretty well. Rob Walton is very happy to get that baseball back. Yes. Watch as you'll see. He'll fool him just a little bit and get him a little bit out front. That's a change up. See how he breaks down a little bit. The wind holds this ball in the ballpark. Comes back with a fastball for a strike to start off Dave Travis. Grounded out and lined out tonight. 0 for 2. 0 for 5 in the NCAA College World Series. Runner going. Here's the throw to the second base side. They got him. Espinal got the tag down in time. Didn't think he would be able to do it, but he did. That was a very quick tag. The opposite of the other, because otherwise the runner would have been safe. It's a tough pitch to throw on, but he gets rid of it very quickly, as you can see. No wasted motion there. That's why he threw it a little bit on the outfield side, but he is out. Watch him. He gets a tag on him very quickly. Espinal, a good tag, and that's the difference in the two tags exactly. between the last two plays we've just seen. Tell you what, second base is no place to try to take tonight because we've had five players thrown out, and you see the reaction of young Mr. Smith. He got him. 
Five runners have been thrown out attempting to steal in the game tonight. So it's been the pitchers and the catchers, Joe, who dominated this one. Well, I said at the beginning I thought it would be the play of the, the pitchers and the infielders, which it has been so far, that would decide who won this ball game. And so far, neither one of them made any mistakes. Time called. The count on the batter is two and two. He swung at that pitch as was out of the strike zone, trying to protect Paul Fry, who was caught stealing. Fry has been caught stealing. Alexa has been caught stealing. Breaking ball outside. On the other side of the ledger, Costco has been caught stealing twice, and Ifflin has been thrown out attempting to steal. Six hits for Indiana State. One hit so far for Oklahoma State. The Cowboys have committed the game's only error. Did not lead to anything back in the third inning. And Monty Ferris was charged with an error. Still three and two. Looks like that might have been ball four. I think it was low. But when you're the DH and you don't play defense, you want to do something <laughs> to contribute. And a DH has to hit to contribute to the ball club. You don't want to be left standing with the bat on your shoulder. Full count with two outs. Now nobody on. Fastball away. Oh. Second walk. Issued tonight by Walton. He also walked Buell back in the third inning. Gary Ward in complete control as he works the Oklahoma State bench. One eye on his pitchers in the bullpen, one eye on his pitcher on the mound. And as we have pointed out before, we have a pinch runner coming on. Robbie Walton's up to 99 pitches as well. Todd Miles is the pinch runner for Dave Travis. And we talked with Gary Ward. He said 110 was about his limit. And he's at 99 right now. Miles, the pinch runner at first. Todd coming off the bench. I would think that they were would send Todd Miles here. It's just a matter of which pitch. And that's what the Oklahoma State ball club will have to try to decide if to pitch out on the first pitch, second pitch, or whatever. But I do believe that they will send Todd Miles as quickly as possible because there are two outs. He is seven out of ten in stolen bases. Mike Lexa is one out of two tonight. <laughs> Rob Walton well aware that Miles is out there to try to pick up that base. He doesn't have a very big lead at first either, so I think he should get a little more. One one on the batter, Mike Lexa. Todd Miles is only 5'6", 150. A freshman from Terre Haute, Indiana. And some of the Sycamore fans starting some clapping. Rally time. It's no score here. Bottom half of inning number six. Game number six. Inside. Count even to the ball and the strike. It's the NCAA College World Series for 1986. And they have made the trip from Terre Haute to Omaha. I think the last pitch was a very smart pitch, the high fastball, to give your catcher a chance to throw the runner out if he's gone on that pitch. When you're ahead in the count, you waste the high fastball and give him a shot at it. But I also think that Todd Miles should get a bigger lead. It's best to be picked off at first base and to be thrown out at second in this situation this late in the ball game. You get a big lead and try to make sure you can steal that base if you go. He's not running and the ball is fouled back one and two. Irv? Joe, I think it's reverse psychology. I think Bob Warren is doing a good job. He's making Walton think about it. He's making Gary Ward think about it. I'm not so sure Miles is going to run now with the one and two pitch. He got nothing to lose. He might turn loose, but it was a mind game. It was a good deal. Well, it's worked. He got a couple of fastballs for Mike Lexa to hit, but I don't see how you waste a player in this situation. You take out your DH. You've got to let the guy go, in my opinion. But like you say, they're playing psychological games with each other, and that's 
part of this strategy. As Gene Mock used to say, hold them close for six innings and then I'll think of something. <laughs> so maybe that's what they're doing. One ball, two strikes with two outs. Miles is back. In the white uniforms, he wears number one. In the gray, he's number 10, and he's surrounded by that number 10. <laughs> Two and two. You might wonder about the choice of uniforms. Indiana State is the home team, yet they have on their traveling uniforms. That's because the visiting team has the choice of which uniform color they want to wear. I don't think they're too disappointed. They lost in the world. So you might you definitely try. want to change that. Right. You <laughs> want to try the gray next. They lose in these, they won't have to worry about it. That's right. They can wash them and pack them up for next year. Two balls, two strikes, two out. Call strike three. Walton gets his third strikeout and gets out of the inning. So a man left for Indiana State here. Still no scores. We move on to inning number seven in Omaha, Nebraska. Espinal, Ferris, and Ventura, the top of the order, coming up from the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. We've seen a lot of this at second base tonight. The runners are having no luck at all, and the game is still dead even. The lovely young ladies who have come out to watch the Cowboys hook up with the Sycamores here. And over to the other side, the blue and white against the orange and black here. Mike Gardner has faced 18 batters in six innings. He's given up one hit, two walks. And in each case, the runner was caught stealing. And strike him out, throw him out, double play. Espinal has popped up and struck out. Mike Gardner's definitely done what his coach Bob Warren wanted him to do tonight, hold these Oklahoma Cowboys in check. But Robbie Walton has done the job for Gary Ward as well, so it's been an excellent ball game. Who will give in first, foul right. back? Or who will tire first, I think is going to be the key here. And Oklahoma State has good backup in their bullpen. Well, at this point, Walton has thrown quite a few more pitches than Gardner. Right. But I think he has the better of it in the bullpen. I've seen Dillard, and he's an excellent throwing left left-handed throwing pitcher. As I've said before, the most impressive thing to me so far in this 1986 College World Series has been the pitching of all the teams that we've done so far. Espinal working ahead in the count now. Irv? What, guys? This sixth game we've had, this guy's got the best location anybody I've seen. He's behind this time, three and one. I've seen better stuff, but I haven't seen anybody better up and down, in and out. He's been terrific from ground level. He's definitely done an excellent job. Fly ball in a deep left center field. The Zion will have plenty of room to make the play. <laughs> and again, that's one of those that takes off at the plate and goes nowhere. Well, it's like batting in the Astrodome exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> They're going to have to hit a line drive for it to go out of here tonight. You're not going to hit a fly ball and it go out. You'll have to hit a line drive. Espinal drives this ball, but he gets it too high in the air. The wind just knocks it down. So the combination of the wind helping to stifle these home run bats of Oklahoma State and the pitching of Mike Gardner is an excellent breaking pitch. Monty Ferris has struck out and grounded out tonight. Gardiner has struck out eight through the first six innings. You mentioned the free swinging cowboy bats. 18 strikeouts in the first two games would indicate that you're right. This is an excellent change up here. He takes a little off. Throws a change up over the outside part of the plate. And if you watch very closely, you couldn't see any change in his motion. One ball and two strikes. If you're going to throw a changeup, what better spot to throw it than at the knees on the outside part of the plate? Very few people can hit it, let alone drive it any place. Ferris 
pops it up. Alexa. Two out. Irv, that was another example of what you're talking about. Excellent location there because he had he had the hitter, Marty Ferris, looking for an off-speed pitch because he threw him the curveball for the strike and then the changeup on the lower and away. He came back with a good fastball on the inside corner. This Joe, guy this, definitely doing what you're saying. Joe, this guy just really knows how to pitch. He knows what he's doing. He's in total command. Bob Warren went out there one time early in the ballgame when he felt that he had speeded up the motion a little bit. And ever since then, the, the rhythm has been sensational. Ventura, 461 average coming in, and he has nothing to show for his efforts tonight. He struck out twice. And when you handle Robin Ventura the way that Mike Gardner is, you're doing a great job because this guy is a good hitter. And he's left-handed, too, which gives him an advantage. Fastball popped up on the left side. T.J. Burke toward the foul line. Three in the air and three outs in the seventh inning. 21 batters have faced Mike Gardiner. Only one hit, no runs. Burke scoreless as we go to the bottom half of inning number seven in Omaha. Everly, Buell, and Burke coming up for Indiana State. The pride of Terre Haute here to root on the Sycamores with an official College World Series cap, the NCAA College World Series. Hope you're all having a good time. We're having a great time. Well, you can see that the, the Sycamores have decided to turn this thing around, obviously, any way they can. It's a scoreless game, bottom of the seventh. Coach Gary Ward has not been involved in many of these this year, not when you average 11 runs a game. Maybe that's one of the problems. They don't know what to do when they get into a close ball game like this. And I think the elements are working against them, along with Mike Gardiner. But that's I, the biggest element. Right. I don't really think that they've hit a ball that probably would have gone out of the ballpark. No, I think they hit right. some that might have gone to the wall or whatever. But he's had them under control. I think actually the ball that Boy Rodriguez hit the right field would have gone out on a normal day. And maybe they would be behind two to nothing. The wind from center field continues to knock that ball down. Mike Everly is one for two. He may be a one of the best-looking young catchers I've seen in a long time. You say he's one for two. Actually, he's four for five. <laughs> he's thrown out three other guys as well, and he's got one right. hit. That's as big as the hits. Right, exactly. Drives it to left field. On the move is Blackman. Makes the catch. Almost overran the ball. Reacting to the sound of what would normally be a, a deep fly ball, he almost overran it a little bit. He did. I thought that one had a chance of going farther than it did because it was a line drive and the wind wouldn't affect it. And that's the first out in the seventh inning. And the batter now will be Jeff Buell. I think Jeff's going to have to be a little more aggressive against Robbie Walton because Robbie has been able to get the ball where he wanted to against Jeff the last two times. And Jeff, as we talked in the pregame show, is a mistake hitter, but he's going to have to get a little more aggressive and stop taking that breaking ball for a strike because Robbie Walton has gotten awfully tough against him when he's gotten ahead of him. And the noise level picks up in Omaha because the uh, Miami Maniac has decided to start one of the waves all the way from Miami. Inside corner strike. See, he's not making any mistakes on Jeff. You no, know, every pitch he's thrown, yeah. Jeff turns around and shakes his head like he can't believe it. <laughs> One curveball on the outside edge, fastball tails back on the inside corner. So he's really mystifying Jeff Brewer. And he also has him now in the hole so that he can kind of play with him a little bit. Ground ball to short. Ferris. Berrigan. Two outs. Did you ever have a night when a pitcher might get beat around a little bit, but everything he threw to you would put him right in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, that happens a lot of times. You know what happens is there are a lot of pitchers that you don't hit well, and that's usually the reason. Their throwing pattern works very well against your weaknesses, and if they can get to your weaknesses, pitchers are gonna get you out most of the time. Two outs, nobody on in the bottom of the seventh for T.J. Burke. An infield single in the fifth inning. Popped up to short in the third. Down too low, and let's give the credit where it goes to Walton and also to Gardner. Two right-handers have done a good job tonight. And Paul Quinzer last night, Mike Loin last night. We have seen some outstanding Dave Lewis pitches. last night. 
I wonder if Dave Lewis' shirt is okay now. The <laughs> way Mike Lloyd <laughs> grabbed his collar last night. And of course, the Seminoles will be back on Tuesday against the Hurricanes of Miami. That'll be a dandy here. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, that'll be a big crowd for that one. I can guarantee you. There's the butt. Be a tough play for Walt, and he can't make it. Still with two outs, a bunt single for T.J. Burke. What happens here, I think, is that Robbie Walton is not expecting a bunt. He's not looking for a bunt. So he makes his pitch. Now he realizes there's a bunt. Now he knows he has to hurry. And he's running full speed toward the line, and there really was nothing he could do. It might have been a blessing that he wasn't able to throw the ball because he probably would have thrown it away. And you know the thing I always fear in that situation when he gets himself into an awkward situation exactly. is the danger that he could hurt himself. He can. And that's one thing that they try to teach you pitchers. Don't throw from an awkward position. With two outs, the runner at first. The pattern continues. The Sycamores have had base runners in every inning but the second. Indiana State's favorite son did not get shut out earlier today in Houston, but uh, he had an off day, and the Sycamore's trying to make up for it. He definitely had an off day. I'm not going to get into who uh, Joe Morgan was uh, rooting for in that game this <laughs> afternoon. Hey, I played for Houston for nine of my big league seasons. There he goes. Runner going. There's the throw to second. Should be there. Oh, the catchers are making this look easy. Six base runners thrown out at second. T.J. Burke is the latest in the inning is over. We have played seven. Scoreless between Oklahoma State and Indiana State. Time for the Cowboys to try to get something started here in Omaha. The folks are trying to get going, but so far a guy by the name of Mike Gardiner has kept them in the corral and some excellent defensive play on the part of both catchers tonight. This is an excellent throw by Adam Smith. He gets up, gets rid of the ball quickly. But I'm very impressed with the second baseman, Aspinall. See how he comes in, makes the tag, and keeps going. Very smooth. And you know, both those throws were right there where all he had to do was move his glove, continue the pattern of his glove right to the man and make the tag. Well, here's the cleanup batter to lead off in the eighth inning, Jim Iflin. No runs, one hit, no errors, and nobody left for Oklahoma State in this game as we go to the eighth inning. And a lot of pressure will start to fall on Robbie Walton if his team doesn't get him a run very quickly. Tailing fastball for a strike. The wind is even picking up a little bit more now, Joe. Yes, it is. But the pressure will fall on Robbie Walton because after a while, if, his team, if Indiana State scores one run, the ball game can be over. You know, that's an unusual happening here in Omaha for a cool front to move in. And we not have any rain. But we have been fortunate through the first three sessions of this 1986 NCAA College World Series. Actually, it's a beautiful night. It's, this is great. It's not so great if you're down no, there on the field there. trying to squeeze up a run. Well, Gary Ward's a little upset here. He's... Down on strikes goes Jim Iflin. That's nine strikes for Gardiner. Gardner has Jim Iflin set up perfectly. Now he throws a fastball right on the outside corner. Not very many hitters can hit that. And what happened to Gardner? He hit the deck out there. I yeah. saw him go out of sight and out to the mound. Well, he's saying his he coach and the, the trainer, mound. John Ferber. But I think he's all right. If he's smiling, he has to be okay. Truthfully, one of the things that I'm noticing in, is that the Oklahoma State Cowboys, as I mentioned, are trying to all do it themselves. They're not trying to put two or three hits together. They're trying to drive the ball out of the ballpark, or they're all looking for a pitch that they can drive out of the ballpark. Well, they're asking for base hits, but uh, part of their problem has been strikeouts in the last 16 innings. 19 of them so far since they've 
come to Omaha, Nebraska, and that is not what they had in mind. No, but we also know that Gary Ward is the exponent of the hitting theory of trying to hit the ball the other way and hit the gaps. And these guys are not trying to do that. See, he's pulling off that ball even though he gets a base hit. He's trying to pull that ball. Berrigan pulls it into right field. That's the second hit. And if you're trying to wait and get a pitch that you can drive out of the ballpark off Mike Gardner, you're going to have problems, and that's what they've had so far tonight. Well, quickly down in the Sycamore bullpen, a left-hander will get up and start throwing behind Mike Gardner. That's only the third hit that he has given up. Warming up is John Howes, a left-hander. Only the third hit that Gardner has given up in Rosenblatt Stadium this season in 15, now 16 innings. Adam Smith is 0 for 2. He's grounded out to the first baseman twice tonight. So he has been able to pull the ball, but in so doing, he's hit it on the ground both times. One ball, runner at first, Irv. John, I'll tell you what, this is not the Little Sisters of the Poor he's pitching against. This guy's amazing. Look at his glove. There's a loose piece of leather here, and he throws it at you every time he comes at you. Foul out of play. Now let's see what Irv is talking about. Look at that leather right there. I don't know how distracting that would be, Joe Morgan, but this guy gives you a lot of leg and a lot of glove anyway. He's tough to read. And he has just baffled these folks. Look at that leather. Well, I don't want to get in the rules again, but you're not supposed to have things hanging off your glove. The pitcher. Back goes Berrigan at first. He's singled with one out here in the top half of inning number eight. Cowboys trying to figure out a way to scratch up something against Mike Gardiner. Two and one. We have two pitchers throwing now. Craig Kozlowski, we saw him on Saturday, is up and throwing. Past the first baseman, down the right field line. Berrigan around second on his way to third. So now Oklahoma State finally has something going. First time they've had a runner that as far as second and all the way to third on the place goes on the play goes Jimmy Berrigan. The ball is hit sharply right under the glove of the first baseman. If yeah. he makes the play, the inning might be over. It is going to be scored a base hit. The ball was hit very sharply, but Jeff Buell didn't, just was not able to get his glove down. So back-to-back -back singles with one out in the eighth inning and the first real test for Mike Gardiner. There are the pitchers. Kozlowski is the right-hander. How's the left hand? There's the coach. Berrigan goes around third as shortstop was trying to fake him, but Berrigan knew the ball was in the right field. He runs around third. See Berrigan slipping off the bag. I don't know if he's he's still standing there, so he must be all right. It's one of the dangers of looking away before you touch the bag. And when there's no play on you, you should always hit the bag in the middle. The question here, as far as the Sycamores are concerned, did Berrigan touch second? Yes, says the umpire. Yes, he did. We can see that in our replay anyway. But Coach Bob Warren will try anything. It's a scoreless game. First real threat for Oklahoma State and Coach Gary Ward on the night. Runners at the corners, one out for Scott Wilkinson. Takes a strike on the outside corner. As I said, here will be the pressure on the infielders again and the pitcher. The pitcher, the pressure on the pitchers to make sure that he gets that ball hit on the ground. And the pressure then is for the shortstop and the second baseman to come up and make the double play to keep the ball game scoreless. Fouled out of play or strike him out. That would be good. Runners at the corners. Berrigan singled, moved to third on the base hit by Adam Smith. 
But in all honesty, you would prefer to get the ground ball than even the strikeout because you give them two shots then. And if you get the ground ball, you can, the inning can be over at one swing. There are a lot of ways that the runner can score from third. Catcher jumps outside that time. First time we've really seen him do that, and he was ready to make a throw to first. Right. I think he was trying to make sure that Mike Gardner does not make a pitch close enough for Scott Wilson, Wilkinson to put in play there. He did not want to strike. No, he was just wasting it. Now he wants to strike inside. And it's driven to left field hard on the line. Burke up to make the play. The tag at third. The Cowboys will have the game's first run. That was a fine play by T.J. in left field. Well, Scotty drove that ball hard to left field. I thought it was going to be over his head at first. He That's went up to get it, and it was hit hard enough and deep enough. It was no problem for Berrigan to score the game's first run here in the eighth inning. one nothing, Oklahoma State. As you see, T.J. going back, excellent play. Times his leap perfectly and comes down with it. Well, that would have been another run if he doesn't make that play. Yep, that would have swept the bases clean. As it is, two outs in the inning, a run in and a runner at first. For Brian Costco, who's walked twice and been caught stealing twice. They're going to appeal at third base, looks like, but there should not have been any doubt about Barry and leaving. He should not have even thought about leaving too soon. They're looking at the home plate umpire, I assume that would have been his call because the third base umpire has to go out and make sure the ball is caught in the outfield. So the umpires have to rotate they around. They rotate around, and the third base umpire goes out. The home plate umpire goes down to third or watches to make sure that the guy doesn't leave too soon. He has a better look at it anyway. Breaking ball stays high. It's one ball and no strikes with two outs. The Cowboys have come up with a run. Hasn't been easy for the Pokes from Oklahoma State, but they lead it one nothing. This is the top of the eighth. Foul back. This is game six of the NCAA College World Series. Earlier today, LSU eliminating Maine. So the Fighting Tigers are still alive. Of Coach Skip Berkman. Loyola Marymount in Arizona tomorrow night, 8 o'clock on ESPN. Miami and Florida State on Tuesday, 8 o'clock. Both games live. Strike two to Costco. Double headers coming up on Wednesday. The first game will match the winner here, either Oklahoma State and Indiana State, against the loser of Arizona, Loyola Marymount. LSU is awaiting the loser of the Miami Florida State game. Both of those games on Wednesday. At that point, we will eliminate two more teams. Beautiful pitch on the corner. And the inning is over. But two hits and the sacrifice fly. Actually, a line drive. Do the damage. The run scores for the Cowboys. They lead it 1-0. The Sycamores will send up the top of the order as they try to even things up in the bottom half of inning number eight. That's it. 1-0. Oklahoma State leads Indiana State here in Omaha, Nebraska. The Cowboys, six straight trips to Omaha, trying to stay alive in the 1986 NCAA College World Series. In front of the contest, they scratched out that run in the eighth inning. We are set to go to the bottom half of inning number eight. Top of the order, Bob Zion, Dan Roman, and Paul Fry coming up. And from what Gary Ward told us today, we have to start watching Robbie Walton very closely now. He's gotten 113 pitches, and Gary Ward told us his maximum was normally 110. So he is at the max then, obviously. Still have a left-hander throwing for the Cowboys in the bullpen. Was Gordy Dillard number 19 earlier. That's Gordy again. All right. Ball one to Bob Zion. The Sycamores have stranded six runners in the first seven innings tonight, so they have been busy. They've had some people out there, but only one of their runners, and the man at the plate, Bob Zion, was able to get as far as third. Well, the same was true of Oklahoma State. They only had one runner get as far as third, but Jimmy Berrigan was able to score, and that's the difference in the ballgame. That is the difference. If I had to question one pitch all night from Mike Gardner, it would have been the pitch that he threw to left. Scott Wilkinson, Scott Wilkinson to let him hit that line drive. He tried to come back inside with a fastball. I think I would have gone with the breaking ball 
for two reasons. One, I have a chance of striking him out. The other reason is I have a chance for him to hit the top of the ball and hit the ground ball for the double play. And that was what he was searching for in that particular situation, the double play. And instead, he got the line drive to deep left field and drove in the run. But how can you question any pitch that the guy's made is only giving up three hits all night? Well, the tying run is on in the bottom half of the eighth inning. We have had some outstanding games so far in the first six of the NCAA College World Series. The RBI, by the way, for Wilkinson is 68th of the year. The Cowboys break through. It was Berrigan, the young man in your picture who scored the run. One run on three hits, one error for Oklahoma State. 0-7 and 0 for Indiana State. Danny with one of those seven hits. It came in the first inning, then he was erased on a double play. The butt, obviously, will be in order. Yes, Bob Warren will definitely try to get Bob Zion into scoring position. Roman missed the butt. He'll walk out, and his coach will walk back. A lot of times we say the bunt is in order and things like that, but it's only in order if the guy can bunt. <laughs> there are a lot of times when you shouldn't put the bunt on, even though it's the play to make, if a guy's not a good bunter or if a guy's not a good hit and run guy on a 3 2 count, you don't send the guy. And I would venture to guess that in college baseball, the players work on the bunt much more than they do at the major league. I level. would guarantee that. The bunt. To the right side. The only play is first. They did it properly. Excellent bunt. If you watch here, Danny Roman gets the barrel out. See, he's got the barrel of the bat out front, and then he just catches it on the end. That's the proper way to bunt. Get the barrel in front of you, and don't let it drop. And quickly coming out to the mound is Tom Holliday to have a visit with his pitcher and catcher. Of course, you think about the major league level bunting, you say, well, it's a lost art now. Well, they pay more money for home runs than they do for bunts, obviously. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I remember Nellie Fox, who was my hero and idol when I first came to the big leagues, and he was also a player coach for the Houston Astros when I first came to the big leagues. And he once told me, he said, home run hitters drive Cadillacs, we single hitters drive forwards. <laughs> The right-hander is Steve Linhard. The left-hander is Gordy Dillard. And Holiday, well aware that his pitcher has reached his limit, right, Irv? Question about it, John. Once again, we've made this point before, but for those who have just joined us, Tom Holiday makes a decision, not Gary Ward. Ward says, I pay him good money. That's his decision, whether or not he yanks him or not. He has decided to go with him. But I guarantee if he makes a few judgments that Gary Ward doesn't agree with, He'll stop that. <laughs> the tying run is at second base. One out here in the bottom of the eighth inning. One nothing is our score. That's the runner at second, Bob Zion. He got as far as third in the first inning. I think they want to leave Robbie Walton in to try to get Paul Fry out, and then I guarantee they'll bring Dillard in for boy Rodriguez. Okay, we'll see what happens. Fry is one for three. He's grounded into a double play, struck out, and singled. And from listening to Joe Morgan the first three days here, this is one of your favorite hitters. Yes, I think Paul's an excellent hitter. He seems to think very well at the plate. The guy's trying to get him out with a certain pitch each time. He sits on that pitch the next time up. High fly ball to left. Blackman toward the foul line. The runner has to hold. I think he was sitting on the breaking ball, and that one was a little too high. Well, there are a lot of hitters that can't resist that pitch up in the eyes. I could never hit it very well, but I would swing at it, too. <laughs> <laughs> that high curveball looks like you can pound it. And immediately, we go to the left-hander. So Joe Morgan was right on. Well, if they're paying him to be a pitching coach, and that's all he's thinking about, that's what he's going to do in this situation. So an excellent outing for Rob Walton. The left-hander Gordy Dillard will come on and try to pick it up for Oklahoma State. The Cowboys are clinging to a one-run lead here. We're in the bottom half of the eighth inning. The tying run is down at second. Two outs when we come back. <laughs> Gordy Dillard on to try to hold on to a one-nothing lead for Oklahoma State here in the bottom of the eighth inning. And the emotion of the College World Series comes to the front when they change pitchers here for some reason. 
I thought they were the Cowboys, not the Rams. <laughs> they're headbutting there. <laughs> now that's a kind of a salute for the excellent job that Rob Walton did. He went seven and two-thirds innings, three hits, three strikeouts, two walks. The runner at second is his responsibility, and Gordy Dillard comes on. His record is four and four. Does not have a save this year. The left-hander, 6'1", 190, 21. He's a senior from Salinas, California. Now, I've seen him pitch before. He has an excellent breaking ball from the left side. And he's averaged 12 strikeouts per nine innings pitch this year. So he uses the curveball very effectively. He'll throw a lot of breaking balls here to Boy Rodriguez. And there's one for strike one. Good breaking ball and a complete change for Boy Rodriguez. He has been looking, of course, at the right-hander. Now he's got to turn his mind around the other way. I think that's a tough thing for a lot of left-handed hitters to do because the breaking ball has been coming toward him all night. Now it's going away from him. And when I hit in that situation, I did just what he did. I would take a pitch just so I could see the different slants. On the corner with another good breaking pitch. Rodriguez does not agree. That's the only danger of taking one. <laughs> <laughs> you may not want to take the second. The wind is blowing in harder, as you mentioned. All and two. The runner at second is Zion. He is the tying run, the potential tying run for Indiana State. It's the bottom of the eighth, two out. Dillard on to pick it up for Walton. Three curves, three, three strikes, and the inning is over. So they strand another runner in the eighth inning. It is 1-0, Oklahoma State leading. The Cowboys come to bat at the top of the ninth. We'll be back to Omaha with the ninth inning after this. I'm John Sanders with Joe Morgan and Herb Brown. We have another outstanding ball game going from Omaha, Nebraska. Ninth inning, 1-0. Still out there on the mound doing the job as best he can is Mike Gardner. He gave up a run in the top half of the eighth inning. Two singles and a sacrifice fly. Anthony Blackman is 0 for 2. He is struck out into a double play twice. Kind of like adding insult to injury, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> You know, I, I'm sitting here thinking about Indiana State, and this is their first appearance in the College World Series. And I tell you, I have been most impressed with their pitchers, more impressed than anyone's except Florida State University, and they were the number one team in the nation. But Paul Quinzer last night, and again tonight, watching Mike Gardner, it's been just awesome. I can see how they made it to the College World Series. They've got excellent pitchers. And really, except for a little bad luck, they could be 2-0 rather than maybe 0-2. Uh, but as uh, another friend of yours once said, it won't be over here for a little bit yet. Right. Out number 27 is always the most always difficult. Always the toughest. <laughs> as Yogi would say, it's never over till it's over. Well, sometimes here in Omaha, it's simply never over, period. <laughs> like the first game, <laughs> Arizona, I guess. It was never over. One and two, the count. Check swing, hops up into the stands. Souvenir for those who have come out in Omaha, Nebraska. They're on the top step, and they've got that last chance, last half of the ninth inning coming up. But the important thing here is for Mike Gardner to make sure that Oklahoma State does not score any more runs. Because then, if you go only one run down, there are a lot of things. You have a lot of options. You can bunt can do a lot of things. The tying run is always at the plate. But if you get two runs down or more, it makes it a lot tougher because you have to get a couple guys on before you can get the tying run to the plate. And it takes a lot of pressure off of the pitcher, knowing that he can make one mistake or two mistakes. In this situation, he knows he can't make any mistakes if the score is only one to nothing going to the ninth, ninth inning. Two two to Blackman. Center, left center field. Zion a long run and he makes it. Nice play. I think the ball might have fooled him a little bit. It carried wow. pretty far. Yeah, I didn't think that he <laughs> felt that that ball, you know, all the other balls have gone out there and come back, so to speak. That one kept carrying. Could be that the wind twisted a little bit on him. This was the ball. Yeah, was I hit. think it is. If you look at the flag now, it's going that way a little bit. He does an excellent job here in that he keeps running and knows where the ball is all the time. 
He does not glide to the ball. He's running to the ball, so he knows where it is. Now, there it is. Nice play by Bob Zion. Good point for outfielders. Run to the spot, make the catch. Get yourself into position first. Exactly. Espinal is 0 for 3. Popped to third. Struck out and fly to center. There's Coach Warren. Hats off to him. A terrific team he put together. There's a call strike. And with this pitching, you can understand his philosophy as a coach to play for a run, run and run. Inning. Exactly. I was wondering about that when he told me that. But then after watching Quinzer pitch and watching Gardner pitch, I can understand why, like you say, he's playing for one run. Line drive. Knocked down by Lexa. The runner hits the deck. Espinal stumbling over the first baseman. We'll have to count bodies and make sure everybody's okay here. Espinal seems to have injured his leg a little bit. That's what we were talking about earlier. Second base, you can knock the ball down and still throw the guy out. But he rushes it. It's a sharp line drive. And you can see Espinal hustling all the way. Touches the bag. Now he trips over Jeff Buell. Check all the parts and see if everything is still there. See, if Lexa throws accurately to first base, the guy's out. What happens is Buell turns to try to tag Espinal, and he was already crossing the bag. So it's first and ten. <laughs> Everybody seems to be all right. It's the error charge to Lexa. Actually, I think Mike had a little more time than maybe he that's, felt. That's what happened. He, he, he sort of panicked a little bit once he missed the line drive, and he rushed his throw. He could have taken his time and made an accurate throw. He would have been able to save himself and his ball club a runner on first. Monty Ferris is 0 for 3. And 0 for 7 in the NCAA College World Series. Runner at first with one out. Espinal is excellent in stolen bases, 41 out of 46. But he's up against a guy by the name of Mike Everly who has thrown three base runners out tonight. He has done an exceptionally fine job in getting the ball to the second baseman or the shortstop who's covered. So this will be an interesting matchup. But if you notice right there, Mike Gardner went very quickly to the plate. So he's giving Mike Everly a lot of help there in holding these guys close. He also went with a fastball, too. Right, but he did it very quickly. He is, the poise of these Indiana pitchers has really impressed me. There's a drive down the left field line, but it will hook foul. And the youngsters will chase that one down beyond the 343 sign. They woke a few people up. Along with Coach Bob Warren, we sneak a peek at the bottom of the ninth. The designated hitter Hamilton. We believe that's the designated hitter who's in the lineup now. Scheduled to lead it off. Then Lexa and Everly. But hitters five, six, and seven. And gonna make a two for one switch. I think that line drive might have scared Bob Warren a little bit. He's coming out to check. Gonder says he's okay. And if I read his lips correctly, it looked like he said two for one switch next time. So he may not be ready to take him out yet. But if he comes back, he's going to do more than just take his pitcher out. Right. The count is one and one. It's one out, a runner at first. We'll have the lefty righty combination working in the bullpen. John Howes, the left hander. Craig Kozlowski, the right hander. So we'll see what Coach Warren has in store. I notice so Bob is still wearing his hair like we did in Fort Polk, Louisiana as well. <laughs> he still has that army cut. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Monty Ferris with a runner at first. One out. It's the ninth inning. Cowboys leading the Sycamores 1-0. Good pitch. One and two. It would really be a shame if Mike Gardner loses this ball game. 
just like it was a shame that Paul Quinzer had to lose last night. But these guys have pitched their hearts out. And I guess that's what NC2A College World Series baseball is all about. But these guys have really shown me something. I mean, they're great competitors, and they're really poised under all this pressure. I think the truth of the matter is we don't really have any losers here, even though Maine has already been eliminated. And one of these two teams will be finished tonight. The, the play and the caliber of play has been outstanding. Well, I've been impressed. This is my first College World Series, but I'm very impressed because I've seen the way these kids are handling this type of pressure. I've seen some guys that are paid to handle this pressure, not handle it this well. Got him swinging. Strikeout number 11 for Gardiner. That will buy him some more time. But there isn't much time left. No. <laughs> it's the ninth. Two outs, thanks to the 11th strikeout of the night. Here's a breaking ball down and away. And it just goes away. And Marty Farris cannot catch up with it. He was checking his finger. I think he has some problems. Maybe he has a blister on his finger, but I'm sure he does not want to come out of there. If he loses, he wants to lose one to nothing. Herb? Joe, he, he definitely does have a blister. He ain't going to go out of there. He's got too much guts. He'll stay. He'll finish. And I think he deserves a chance to finish as well. One ball to the number three hitter, Robin Ventura. Robin is 0 for 3, struck out twice tonight. That is hit hard into right center field. Back toward the wall and a roll to the fence. Around third, headed for the plate is Espinal. It's 2-0 Oklahoma State. So finally, Ventura comes through the two-out double, his 92nd RBI of the year, and a little bit of breathing room for the Cowboys. And in defense of Mike Gardiner, the inning should have already been over, if not for the error. Here's Robin Ventura. If you watch, he gets good balance here and good extension. That's almost perfect hitting there. And it will be an unearned run. Two nothing. Fourth hit of the game for Oklahoma State. He's disappointed, you know. But he's maintained his composure even in the face of what's happened along with his coach, and I think that's a, a sign of good coaching. I do too. I think that you're, as the old saying goes, you know, the team is an image of its manager. And Bob Warren has been composed all throughout this College World Series. He shows confidence, but it's a quiet confidence, and that's what I see in this Indiana State team. And also, here again, he's really showing me something. I like this, because Bob Warren is going ahead, even though a lot of people say, well, you should take this guy out. I think, under the circumstances, this guy deserves to finish this ball game, because, as I said, there should have been three outs already, and the guy has pitched his heart out. Could be another run on the base hit to center field. Heading for the plate is Ventura. 3-0, Cowboys. Well, here comes Bob. I think he's gone as long as he can. But I know that he appreciates the effort given by Mike Gardner tonight. And I'm sure all his teammates do. That run is not earned either. A pitching change for Indiana State. The folks are trying to cut down the sycamores. Plenty of action from Omaha, and we are not finished. It's the ninth inning. Stay with us. We'll be back with more of this 1986 NCAA College World Series after this. A new pitcher for the sycamores here in the ninth inning as they bring in the left-hander, John Howes. Record of nine and four, ERE 3.55. Try to pick it up here for Mike Gardiner. Mike Gardiner is gone, but not forgotten, certainly. He pitched a tremendous game here tonight, and his teammates acknowledged the effort that he put forth. All the infielders came in and patted him on the back for a nice effort, and the fans gave him a fantastic ovation when he walked off. It's like I said at the beginning of the ball game. It's a tough situation because all the pressure falls on the pitchers and on your infielders. 
and I was speaking in terms of making a double play or being able to make a tough play in the clutch. But the game has not gotten out of hand, but Indiana State has gotten two runs behind because of an error by an infielder because the pitcher's done an excellent job, and this is no way to put the blame on any infielder, but Here's that Mike is Malizzi. the pressure that comes when you are in a situation like this. I've made mistakes myself under the same circumstances, so I know how they feel. But infielders are under a lot of pressure in a game like this. Melizia is the pinch runner. How's the new pitcher? 23-year-old senior. Six oh, 175 pounder. So Melizia runs at first. And the name Melizia is probably familiar to you because he was here last year in Omaha, Nebraska. Not in orange and black. He was a member of the Miami Hurricane. Maybe it was two years ago. I guess oh, it must be two years. Two years I was going to say, you can't transfer and go the same year, can you? No. <laughs> but Melizia has been a member of the Miami Hurricane. Okay, we are now told that, yes, I remember the name. He was here last year, Melizia. A special release from Miami to play for Oklahoma State. Yes, sir. No, nope. no, nope, not quite. Oh, no. They called the box. Well, I didn't call that. <laughs> All right, show us again. Bob Nelson, the home plate umpire, made the call. Melizia goes to and second. And Bob is upset about it. Watch him hold his side because he's badly bruised. He took a ball to the chest, and he doesn't want to come out and argue. Yeah, he can't even keep his balance. <laughs> <laughs> he's falling He is down a little slope. bit beyond the halfway line, right? right? He's falling down the slope. Well, Bob Warren does not agree. And the discussion goes on between Coach Warren and the home plate umpire Bob Nelson. And coming down is Randy Crystal. He is the crew chief. The argument that Bob is making is that the first base umpire or the third base umpire should be able to see better whether Melizia steps halfway or towards first base. In a, they're in a better position to see it than your home plate umpire is what he's arguing. He's pointing to those two guys and saying they didn't call it. How can you call it? So that's the point he's trying to make there. Is that a true situation that most balk calls come from the yes. infield umpire? Yes, most balk calls will come from your first base umpire or your third base umpire. Swing and a miss by Berrigan, who finally received some attention. No balls and one strike to him. Mark Melizia is on at second. Two outs, two runs in. Three nothing, Cowboys. It's been a struggle. The game was scoreless into the eighth inning. Oklahoma State came up with a run, and here in the ninth inning, two unearned runs for the Cowboys. Brown ball up the middle base hit. Knocked down by the shortstop. Tried to relay it to second base, but no dice. Nice play. A diving play by Roman saves the run. I thought it was going into center field. I did, too. I thought it was by him. He might have caught it behind him. That's an excellent play. And he was smart enough to try to get it to Mike Lexa in order to get him to throw Berrigan out at first. Breaking ball slammed up the middle. Excellent play. From the front. That's an excellent play. Now he gets it to Mike Lexa. 
So the run, the inning is still alive. Adam Smith had a base hit his last time up. He put Berrigan into scoring position for the first run of the game. Curveball strike. Runners at the corners. The runner at third is Mark Malizia. And Jimmy Berrigan with the infield single on at first. Six hits now for the Cowboys. Five of them have come in the last two innings. They had only one hit going into the eighth inning. Two hits in the eighth. Three hits here in the ninth. That's the first time I've seen Mike Everly move. I think that might have cost Malizia the pitch there because he raised up a little bit. I think he thought Berrigan was going from first base. Move to first. We have runners at the corners with two outs now. Two runs have scored, and both those runs, keep in mind, are unearned. Through the right side, it'll score another run for Oklahoma State. Berrigan stops at second. Runners at first and second as Mark Malizia scores the run. RBI number 36 for Adam Smith. So RBIs to Robin Ventura, Jim Ifflin, and now Adam Smith. Back to the bullpen we go for Craig Kozlowski. And you can close the book on Gardiner. He gives up four runs in the game. Only one of them earned. The three here in the ninth are unearned. We will have still another Sycamore in the center of the diamond when we come back. Four nothing, Oklahoma State leading Indiana State, but it was much closer than that in truth. It was a one run ball game coming into this, the ninth inning, and an error kind of opened the floodgates as Craig Kozlowski will try to close them now. Five and three with 12 saves in 50 innings of pitching. Kozlowski, the third pitcher, used by manager Bob Warren here in the ninth inning. Kozlowski, 23 year old senior, he's from Chicago, Illinois. 6'3", 205 pounds. More live action coming up here on ESPN on Monday. It's the winner's bracket. Loyola Marymount against Arizona. 8 o'clock Eastern time. Sam Rosen, Rick Wolf, Herb Brown here for that one. Joe and I will rejoin you on Tuesday for Miami and Florida State. The defending champion against this year's top-ranked team in the regular season or the battle for the championship of the state of Florida. That's at 8 o'clock Eastern time, all live, right here on ESPN. Hope to see you here. Bob Warren taking a good long list at the roster, the scorecard. Down 4 nothing now. And Kozlowski will try to finish it off. All the runs scored after there were two outs. Yes, that's tough part about this and that will make the loss if it is a loss even more devastating to the Sycamores because they'll replay this over and over all year saying if we would have made this play or if we would have made that play we might have still been playing and I think that's one of the problems with baseball <laughs> I guess the real problem here is we have runners at second and first Berrigan at second Adam Smith, who got the RBI single on it first. In the case of a major league game at this point in the year, you always have another one tomorrow. Now, That's true. For the loser here, there is no other game exactly. tomorrow. Exactly. Two balls and no strikes to Scott Wilkinson, who is the eighth cowboy to bat here in the ninth inning. Four consecutive hits after two were out to drive in the three runs. Now it's two and one. I guess there's another way you can look at this as well. You can only hold good hitters down so long. And you continue to give them extra chances, and you're going to finally pay for it. They didn't average 11 runs a game by accident. 
No throw to second. Two balls and two strikes now with two outs and two on. It's a three-run ninth inning for the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. Trying to stay alive, and if they do stay alive, they will be playing at 5 o'clock Eastern time on Wednesday. Waiting for the loser of Monday's matchup between Loyola Marymount and Arizona. The other winner tonight in the loser's bracket was LSU, waiting for the loser of the Miami-Florida State game. So single games coming up on Monday and Tuesday, both winner's bracket games. Doubleheader next Wednesday, and we will eliminate two more teams on Wednesday. Come right back with the two undefeated teams on Thursday night. It's a long road to Omaha. And down the stretch, it's also a long road for these teams. Yeah, you just wonder if someone can join those eight teams that have gone undefeated. If that can happen again. That's part of the story that remains to be told. Eight times a team has gone through undefeated, but seven times a team like LSU, Oklahoma State, Indiana State has lost the first game and come back to win the championship. Arizona did it twice. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Kozlowski trying to close the door and can't do it yet. Well, he keeps getting the fastball and the breaking ball up. And from that point, Scott Wilkinson just keeps fighting it off. He has to get that pitch down one way or the other. Get the breaking ball down or the fastball down. I think he'll be able to make him put the ball in play. Cowboys trying to cut down the Sycamores. Lead 4-0. They have added three here in the ninth. Change up. Down too low. Full count, three and two. And good motion on that pitch. Craig wanted that pitch, did not get the call. Change up low, but he really has good motion. the battle down on strikes four hits three runs all unearned score for the Cowboys of Oklahoma State one more mile to go for those watching in Stillwater the last at bat in this one belongs to Indiana State they need four in the bottom half of the ninth in Omaha game six of the